Hello and welcome to episode 12 of Video Game Logic. Today's show was recorded on March 22nd, 2016. I'm your host, gaming psychologist, and with me as always, my monster of an energy drink. <laughs> Caffeine rage. How are you this week, sir? Doing okay. I'm a little frustrated with some YouTube stuff, but we'll get into that into the games that we, well, at least I didn't play. <laughs> <laughs> right, and speaking of the games we played this week, I almost forgot to read the topics. <laughs> On today's show, it's going to be the games we played this week. Digital Homicide is suing Mr. Jim Sterling. The GDC Awards happened, and we're going to talk about the winners. And rumor, is this the last year for the Wii U? We'll also have Community Corner and our Steam Weekly Deals discussion. There we go. I already asked you how you were. Well, you're and concerned about me. I'm not sure why. Is there something I should know? Um, maybe. Uh, I don't know. I haven't listened to Kerbalcast yet, so I don't know. Because <laughs> you keep saying you made it worse, so maybe you should be concerned. Oh, um, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure if I should say you should be, or if it's not a, or you know, it's not a big deal. Uh, well, we'll see what you say after about Wednesday or Thursday when you finally get around to listening to that. Yep. 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 Uh, but in response to how you were doing, now I'm going to tell you how I am doing, and that is swell. I had a good day today. Uh, Tuesday mornings, I don't do client stuff. I just stay home. Uh, but normally, or normally and, I stay and home. And play Eve. Yeah, but instead today, me and my wife and my kid went to the Discovery Museum in Chattanooga. and we the Discovery had a Museum? Uh-huh. Or, well, the Discovery Kids Museum. I, I'm not sure if you should be discovering kids. That may be illegal in your state. <laughs> Way to take a great family day with some cherishable <laughs> memories and just turn it into a huge pedophile joke. That, that's welcome. a serious. That's a serious congratulations, by the way. Well done. <laughs> I approve. That's one of the reasons I like you so much. But no, just had a fun day. I'm tired, though. Been oh, a- so you don't want to record tonight? All right, well, uh, <laughs> thanks for listening, everyone. That's right. <laughs> Bye-bye now. <laughs> no, it's just I had, I had a long day, but it was a great day. You know, family days are are fun. But uh, other than that, everything's just normal for me. Didn't get to play as many games as I would have liked to this week with some crazy clients and. Well, I should. Well, aren't I should most be of your clients somewhat crazy? Yeah, I was gonna say I should be careful throwing that word around since you know <laughs> I am a therapist. Uh, c- crazy is that a clinical term? <laughs> That is a term that we that we use behind clients' backs whenever we are upset with them. That Fucking does not nutball. make it. That does not make it into the official therapy notes. Which I realized I didn't uh, cuss enough last week. So fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, child rating <laughs> or child friendly rating. Anyways, would you care to move swiftly into the games you played this week? Well, how about I start with one that I didn't play this week? Okay. Which could be a lot of games, but Call of Ores Gun, or not Gunslinger, but Bound in Blood. I talked about this during one of our little recording sessions, which we'll get to towards the end of the games I played this week. Right. I was excited to play this game on my YouTube channel. I was excited I, to watch you play this game on your yeah, YouTube channel. Yeah, I got channel. this game uh, late last year, and I decided to, uh, you know, I wanted to do a first person shooter. It's been a while. So I loaded it up, got all my recording stuff ready, got my water, my Kool-Aid. I'm sitting here ready to go, hit record, do my opening spiel during the uh, uh, during the main menu, and go to hit play uh, to uh, enter the main game, and it crashes. Fun times, okay. So I think, okay, well, maybe it's my recording software. So I switch recording software. I usually keep two or three ready to go. And I forego everything, and I just do a dry run, hit, press uh, start on the on new game, it crashes. Okay, that's not good. Try my third, my backup option. So I'm gone from uh, DX Tory to uh, OBS Studio, now I'm to regular OBS. And it still crashes. Okay. So this is odd, because they, you know, they're 
fairly significant recording programs. I mean, granted, OBS Studio and OBS are pretty similar, but... Okay, so I decide... Wait, is it crashing with not the recording software? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay, time to break out the Google Foo and see what's going on. And I tried about every fix I could. Including, I might add, and here, this tells you just how crazy this is. One of the suggested fixes for a crash on uh, game start was to actually change the uh, the hertz that your sound card plays. <laughs> I'm not making this up. I f I'm raising both eyebrows, but only because I it's physically impossible for me to raise just one eyebrow. Oh, uh, you need to practice that. If the if your computer is not set to the proper, I, I, I don't want to call call it frequency, but uh, playing at a particular sound quality level, it crashes the game. Only problem is I was already on that setting, so that didn't work. So I did some more digging, digging, digging. At this point, it's too late for me to record anywhere. I, I just want to find out what the hell is going on with this thing. Right, okay. Turns out that it does not support any processors with more than four cores. And it doesn't support anything above Windows, I think, XP. Oh. Now, mind you, granted this is an old game, but it was released in 2009. Windows 7 was out in 09. Uh, no, no, it was out in uh, uh, later that year. It was literally the same year, but it wasn't technically out yet. Oh, okay. But it's just mind-boggling, but... Then again, I did. I, I'm going to blame myself on this one because I made the mistake of thinking that a fucking Ubisoft game was going to work. Oh yeah, that's that was your first mistake right there. So yeah, it, it's my fault. I mean, to to be honest, I was getting it from Uplay. So what what do I expect, right? <laughs> the worst place to get games in the history of ever. Well, uh, actually, I originally got it from Newegg. Which, I wonder if I should get a hold of Newegg and let them know that they're selling a game that, uh, doesn't work. You probably wouldn't be the first person to tell them that. Yeah, true. Uh, and it, it kind of pisses me off that so many games out there that are sold on the digital mediums, uh, you know, just flat out don't work on modern systems without some heavy, heavy modification to game files or uh, loading them up in uh, special you know, compatibility modes. It, it's just crazy to me. I mean, I understand a game from the very early 2000s, you know, that doesn't even support HD resolutions. You know, it looks at a monitor system and goes, what the hell is this? But 2009 <laughs> isn't exactly that long ago in computing hardware. I mean, granted, the average computer is a lot more powerful now. But behind the scenes, not a lot has changed outside of going beyond four cores. So I'm going to say... Yeah, this is you know, probably a very bad port. I, this might be a stupid question, but did you try to run it in compatibility mode and just see what it did? I tried the entire spectrum of compatibility modes that I have access to. Okay. Oh, uh, Trust me, as soon as I saw it didn't support Windows 7, that was the first thing I tried. Oh, it, Just a complete letdown, and that actually ate up a good evening plus, then some, just... Because I was determined to figure out what the hell is going on. Granted, I probably could uh, trick it into running by just shutting down cores through a program. But at this point, you know, fuck them. <laughs> that is the correct answer. I I'll em. find something else to play. It's not like I don't have a backlog. Yeah, it's not like you don't have other games you could play. Yeah, only problem is that, you know, I have to go back to the choosing again and figure it out. And yes, the, I do call it the choosing. Okay, I was gonna say, <laughs> did you did you say the choosing, or did I mishear you? No, uh, that's what I call it. <laughs> Whenever I make this huge list and trying to figure out what the hell I want to play, huge tracts of land. <laughs> well, I, my l list for my next series or potential games for it is a good thirty or forty titles long, and that's just what I feel like playing. Yeah, because you've got a huge. Like 800 tracks games. of land? <laughs> yes, you've got huge tracks of land in your game library <laughs> with like 800 plus games. So. Uh, Actually, I'm over a thousand. 
I'm, look at me. I'm Caffeine Rage. I'm over a thousand <laughs> games in my library. Mm. There's nothing else to do here. And that that doesn't come from me being jealous at all of that number <laughs> of games. No siree. Not jealous one bit. Maybe a little. <laughs> or a lot. You, or the fact that I've gotten, uh, I want to say, probably close to 50 review titles in the last six months. Yeah. I mean, granted, some of the games have uh, absolutely sucked, but... There's been some good ones out there. And if you want to see me going through them, you know, the Sunday Sampler is where I do it. There you go. And well, where do we find you on YouTube? Uh, Gaming with Caffeine Rage. Ding. All right. Which I did have a good one this week, but uh, uh, it's not something I really want to go into too much. Well, you well unless you on. really want me to uh, go into it, but I, I mean, have two it's other up games to, I ta- uh, to talk about as well. <laughs> it's up to you. These are the games you played this week. You can decide what to talk about and what not to. Well, I dug up another game that I haven't played in a while, a CCG. Okay. A collectible card game, Spellweaver. Spellweaver. I don't think I've ever played Spellweaver. It's interesting. It's more on the Magic, Magic the Gathering style of uh, CGG, where you're where you're building your deck from different aspects. It's not like uh, Hearthstone where you're you pick your hero and you have a set of cards that you play and that's it. It's oh, more, sorry. Uh, it's more along the lines of Magic the Gathering where, okay, you pick your hero, which does give you powers. And those powers are dependent on a particular color of mana. But outside of that, you can build your deck however you want. Right. I have this game installed. Uh, a few... Uh, I'm not sure how many co-optional podcasts ago it was, but they talked about this game and it had had a big update and they'd improved a whole bunch of stuff. And I was like, oh, that actually sounds really good. Kind of like Hearthstone Plus, you know, kind of a good middle ground between magic and hearthstone and i yeah, installed I say, it to so, play it and i never did yeah i will say that it has some interesting things about it you know, probably the toughest thing to really wrap your head around just because i i don't have any experience with something like this is the speed system in it where mm-hmm. every creature has an innate speed that it has between a rating of one and four oh, actually zero and four. Zero means that you can't attack at all and uh, creatures that are faster uh, are able to literally dodge past slow creatures. So it adds another element to your deck building. That's interesting. So uh, I was having, a, I had a match earlier. I usually just play against the AI because the AI is actually pretty good in this game with some you know exceptions on some edge cases. And I had a AI that was, uh, able to just get around my defenses by having a speed four card that I had no defense against. Fancy. That's uh, uh, an interesting bit of, of game design. Yeah, and there's cards that will speed up and slow down depending on various situations. And there's cards that will slow down your opponents, uh, especially uh, the undead, the black aspect, which uh, has a lot of powerful but slow creatures. They have a lot of spells that also just slow down the enemy board to make it so that they could actually attack some of the faster creatures. Or then you have uh, other aspects like, I think the green has all the little fragile speedsters. speedsters. Uh huh. And you can mix and match them. So uh, you, the deck I usually play is actually a, a combination of white and black, which has, uh, it, the white doesn't have a lot of healing in this game. Uh, like at Magic the Gathering. It's a bunch of angels and uh, some direct damage and uh, that sort of thing. And black is undead and uh, actually has some ways to summon creatures as well. It's interesting. So uh, a combination of those turns into an interesting deck. Uh, Let's just put it that way. I know I'm using the word interesting a lot because it's hard to really describe without going into a lot of the mechanics of the game and I don't want to go on for another half an hour about it. <laughs> well, I'm very familiar with using the word interesting. That's probably 50% of the words that I use in therapy sessions is, well, it's a phrase. Interesting. Tell me more about that. <laughs> yeah, and meanwhile, you're writing down various forms of crazy. 
<laughs> all the adjectives for that describe their type of crazy. Either that, or I'm in my notes. I'm actually sketching out like Eve Doodles, like oh, I'm mining all of these asteroids. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I have so many lasers. But that will be in I don't know, fifteen or twenty minutes. Whenever it's my turn to talk about Eve. Yeah, because that's going to be probably your first thing, isn't it? No, I always save you for last. Okay, but. well, let, let's uh, bring you into this with my third game, Terraria. Terraria. And since this is releasing on Friday, the first episode of our collab series will be live by then. That is correct. Each of us have our own screen caps, and then we've both got the same audio. Um I didn't really do any editing to mine except to cut off, you know, the the beginning and the end. Yeah, bits. I just did the trim as well. Yeah, so uh, I'm sure later on we'll do more editing, especially uh, when we have to travel long distances, just because we're on a large world. But Terraria, for those who don't know, it's I don't want to say 2D Minecraft because that really sells Terraria short. Because Minecraft is really, at the end of the day, a giant sandbox with some loose rules. Uh, Terraria has a lot more going on. It's more of a 2D RPG, almost, or or, or RPG light. I would have said 2D Minecraft adventure game. Well, uh, you Minecraft could always use the term almost uh, Metroidvania. Yeah, Metroidvania crafting game. That's pretty good. Even though it's not technically a Metroidvania game, uh, Metroidvania is also another term that gets thrown out there a lot, which it's kind of perverted the term. Uh, almost like roguelike nowadays. <laughs> yeah, but Terraria is huge. If you don't know what Terraria is and we're and you don't understand what we're saying, just, just Google it. Yeah, or come watch uh, our I, YouTube videos on uh, Gaming Psychologist's channel and Gaming with Caffeine yeah. Rage. Ding, ding. Okay. Uh, tell him when he's win, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> You've won a video with a, an ad perfectly chosen for you right in front of it. And on my channel, oh, that'll be right a first. after it. Based on Google's perfect algorithms. Unless you have because AdBlocker. Google's never screwed up. Anyways. But uh, yeah, we're playing, we're playing Terraria. We've recorded at this point four episodes in total. The first one will be up Wednesday at noon, right? Yeah, uh, noon Eastern Daylight Time. And uh, the first few episodes are just us not exactly faffing about. We're exploring, well, Rage is exploring and I'm digging a huge hole. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to think that my view may be more interesting if you don't like mining. <laughs> I mean, my view is almost entirely underground. I spend three-fourths of every video underground going, ooh, what's over here? Well, to be fair, I do spend a lot of time underground as well. It's just I'm running around pre-made caves instead of digging them myself. Well, I've dug into a couple of pre-made caves. I think the pre-made caves have got like the best, at least so far, loot or, or resources in their walls. It's very rare that I find anything better than copper unless it's in a cave that's already, you know, pre-existing underground. It's like, oh, look at all this. Well, to me, it's like, oh, look at all this high-level ore. <laughs> Yeah, and I've uh, played some more on my own as well on a secondary character, just trying to get a feel for the game as well. Yeah, I saw that. I keep meaning to do that, but I haven't had as much time this week, and I obviously can't play Eve less, so. <laughs> uh, but Terraria is a lot of fun, and I originally got it very cheap, and it's been one of those games that has the biggest bang for the buck that I could think of. Yeah, I played two bucks for Terraria, and I played it for two hours like a long time ago by myself and originally i was like no this game isn't for me but i just needed a friend to play it with and enjoy it yeah for a now while. it's uh whatever i start calling tom you're like really has it been that long already <laughs> to be fair i do call tom a little bit early to you know let, let us get our ending spiels going yeah but it's just it's a lot of fun i don't you know i don't know how to how to describe it any more than I'm just having a good time bullshitting with you and playing some games. I mean, that's the truth of it. Yeah, that's probably the closest that we're going to have to a video podcast. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe someday we'll make some money doing this whole YouTubing and podcasting thing and actually buy webcams. and. I'll get face rig uh, to rip off the red panda. 
<laughs> I'll just let you stare at my hairy, ugly mug. My huge beard. It's getting really big. I need to trim it. I've got six or seven inches of of beard length oh hanging off my chin. If I like turn, tilt my head down too far, it rubs against my mic and makes a funny swishy noise, which I, <laughs> you probably just heard because I did it on purpose. Yeah. So you are a dwarf. Yeah, pretty know. much. I've got long hair. I've got a big beard. Oh, I'm spiking. What's my audio doing? What are you doing there, bud? I might have accidentally got some of my beard tangled in my mic. <laughs> <laughs> that has happened before. Well, you just clip your mic into your beard and be done with it. You know, I could actually do that. <laughs> my beard could easily hold this mic. I could just. Yeah. Sit only it. problem is that I imagine uh, it would bounce around a bit in the beard. Yeah, and it would sound awful just whoosh, 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 the whole time. <laughs> Maybe I should do a little, like a little joke test recording or something for that and put it on my channel or add it as a, a blueprint of one of these episodes someday. Well, I know Team Fortress 2 had the beard camera. Now you have the beard mic. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, that my last little statement about Terraria kind of summed it up. Just having fun bullshitting and playing some games with a friend. Yeah, some games really need a friend to play with. I have played a lot more Terraria just on my own, but I always I peter out uh, oh, probably about 10 or 15 hours in, which sure is a very long game. Yeah, I didn't realize this until I started playing with you, but apparently there's uh, not exactly a story, but like lots of bosses that you can find and fight. And oh, yeah. You can I mean, build towns and people will well, come live in them. I'm and... pretty sure uh, we already have the stuff to summon the first boss if you really want to fight it. <laughs> I'm not ready for that yet. Maybe like by episode 10 we can fight the first boss. Maybe sooner, but definitely not right now. Yeah, we've barely scratched the surface in four episodes. L let's put it this way. I was poking around online just to look at other thumbnails to try to get an idea for mine. Yeah. Yes, I put actual effort into my thumbnails. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Even the and, ones I throw in Photoshop, I don't put much effort into them. Yeah, meanwhile, I look at other thumbnails and think, huh, that that's a good idea. I'll steal that idea, not the thumbnail itself. I'll use your idea as a springboard for my idea. <laughs> yeah, you're just going to upload the thumbnail with uh, uh, GWCR crossed out. <laughs> <laughs> just put um, GP. <laughs> Actually, that's a really good idea. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it would be a fun joke. Okay, can I talk about my stuff now? Uh, if you really want to. Okay, I really want to. All right, so games I played this week. First is The Factory. And yes, that's the name, The Factory. I was browsing through the games that Google Play recommended that I play, and it was like The Factory. And I was like, okay, what is this game called The Factory, and why does Google Play know me so well? <laughs> um, actually, it's... It's boring. It's it's not very great. Um, you are a factory manager who is in charge of managing the production line of a factory. And you can buy all sorts of uh, kind of level one production goods. Yeah, I'm looking at the screenshots of it. Uh, sorry. It, it's basically a spreadsheet, isn't it? Yeah, it's, a, it's got some spreadsheet stuff. Um, and then just pictures of goods. And basically there are build chains. And you can build the... You can take the the goods and manufacture them into level one products, which can be sold or combined in different ways to form different level two products, which can be sold or can be combined in different ways to make level three products, which can be sold. And each level you go up, the complexity increases, but the payout also increases. And it's one of those games that's kind of, it kind of operates like a clicker game. You know, you click in the beginning and once you advance far enough, you can build machines that will do, you know, basically assembly lines that will produce stuff for you. And then you can get purchasing officials who will buy goods and selling officials who will sell them and, it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And you can put all this stuff in place. The problem is, is that once you do that, you can get to that point extremely quickly. Um, I was at that point where I had one of everything, one purchaser, one seller, one assembly line, 
and and one, a partridge in a pear tree. Yeah, and a smart control unit, which um, helps to ensure that everything works better. Because if you don't have the smart control unit, it's just kind of random. The purchaser will buy random production materials, and the assembly line will just build. It, it'll just see like, oh, you've got the thing in your inventory to build this, so I guess I'll build that. And then the seller will only sell one thing at a time. But when you get basically a manager, um, you can give it some basic extru- instructions to chain things together so that you're focusing on a single product line or whatever. And all of this is really fun for about two hours, and then you go, oh, that's all it is? Because <laughs> the thing about these games is they need to have depth and complexity in order to stay interesting. But with one of everything, which, like I said, it took me about two hours to get there. Maybe if you're not as into this sort of stuff as I am, it might take you longer, but still. I was like... Oh, train. Cold oh, sorry. Train, baby. Oh, choo-choo. <laughs> I'm just going to press on. Anyways, okay. once you get, you know, one of everything in place, it's like, oh, there's not enough complexity to keep this going because you can only do some really basic supply chain, you know, setups and cell chain setups. And then it's like, well, that's it. It can now do its own thing and make me infinite am- an infinite amount of money. And there's there's no secrets or anything. Uh, once I unlocked all of the, the different goods you can produce, which happens as you... Um, produce different things it's like oh you got a schematic for a new product because you showed that you can use it once i had unlocked everything i went and i looked online to make sure there were no secrets there's none it's you know you got what you got and there's nothing else that you can find so basically after a couple of hours of unlocking everything i could set up automations to make money but it's like why would i do that i've already basically beaten the game so there's there's no depth like maybe they should have called it one of everything <laughs> Market prices don't rise or fall. Everything stays completely static. There's no other interactivity, like no outside circumstances that can affect you. It's just like the in-app purchases for the game, it, you know, it has those because uh, of, of course, course it does, are money. Like you can directly buy in-game cash, uh. which I don't know why you would want to do that because there's no need to. And two, you can buy supplies, which... It's called a random supply drop, and once a day for, I think it's seven days, you get a random supplies, like 300 in-game dollars supplies. worth of random supplies to build stuff. And I'm like, why? If you start to run a little bit low on money, just buy some of the cheapest supplies, which is, which is paper products, and then you can produce cardboard boxes, which, you know, you're spending a dollar to produce the box, you sell it for 250 it's not a lot of profit margin, but it's like, well, I've almost ran myself in the hole. Well, let me buy some cardboard, make it into a box, and sell it. You do that a few times. It's like, okay, I'm good. So I, uh, I it's it has the skeleton of a good idea, just it doesn't follow through or go deep enough. Yeah, it's a great premise, but then it just kind of runs out. Because so you know, basically, if uh, it's uh, a a mobile cheap man's version of Factoro. Yeah, yeah. And if there was more to it, I'd be like, great, let's do that. But there's nothing yeah, else to Yeah, if they had it. something like uh, random events where, you know, a machine breaks. That would be great. Machine breaks, pl- prices can fluctuate. Because then, instead of like, oh, well, I know that I can just build whatever. Yeah, well, just uh, not go on autopilot. You have to watch the market. Right. Uh, I'm looking at the uh, the... Screenshots here. And uh, what happens? Uh, they could have had a thing where uh, your toaster uh, calls the fire and it it costs you money because you're sued. And suddenly the profit margin on your toasters are gone because nobody wants to buy them. Yep. That's, yeah, that's good. You know, the, the only thing that you can do once you actually unlock all of the stuff is you can go to see um, what your profit per minute is or something like that there's a graph there's plenty of graphs actually a lot of detailed information you can go see like what your profit per minute is and basically just get that as high as you can that's the only other thing i can figure out to do in the game that might be interesting it's just to see how high i can push that number but even then i'm going yeah i don't i don't think so i'll probably just Uh, install this i think i know the perfect person for this game uh rogues back in world of warcraft 
<clears throat> they love to see numbers get high. <laughs> yep, that might work for them. But uh, so yeah, that's it for the factory. If you're looking for a a factory management game that'll last you about two or three hours, well, there you go. But if you want an actual factory management game, go play Factro instead. Isn't it Factorio? Factorio or whatever. You know, I was close enough. Several, and besides, screwing up names is my thing. That's true. Several <laughs> people have recommended that to me this week, so I'll probably buy it. Yeah, I'm and looking play at it, it as well. While my wife is gone and <clears throat> talk about it. Uh, but anyways, next on my list is Clash Royale. Oh boy, here we go. <sighs> I, I still hate the mechanic of waiting to open chests. I still hate it, but I'm just I'm not gonna get worked up about it this time. There's a YouTube video coming within a week probably oh where boy. I get really worked up about it. But I'm not gonna get too worked up about it, just it still sucks. Now, I've hit a I've hit a point where I feel like I'm banging my head against a wall, and I'm not a hundred percent sure what has happened. So I I went uh, I got to arena four. Okay. And I was there for a little while, and now I've gotten knocked back down to Arena 3. Um, and I've been stuck there for four or five days. Yeah. And obviously, I don't expect to like get to... I think the top arena is Arena 9. Since I'm not paying any money, I don't expect to get there yeah. You know, like tomorrow. But I just can't get back out of this, this spot that I'm in. And I'm not sure why. Well, I've tried uh, to- I saw, well, I saw on the... I watched bits and pieces of the co-op show podcast, and one of them just happened to be uh, Total Biscuit talking about uh, this game, and he was talking about how he hit a brick wall as well. <clears throat> and uh, he was talking about how the game set up where you're more often than not facing against the losers of the next bracket up. So if you're in four, you're facing against the losers from uh, five when they drop down. And the problem with that is that they have the higher end cards from their few victories in arena five. So you're facing off against things that you sometimes can't even fight against because you don't have a good counter against it. Yeah. That's part of my problem. Um, I, I just got into three and I immediately got knocked back down to two and I sat at two for a long time until I was able to scrape together enough wins to level up both my characters so that my towers got slightly more powerful, and then my cards that I used frequently. And that was when I was able to break into Tier 3, or Arena 3. But now I'm stuck fighting all these people with some Arena 4 cards, mostly high-level Arena 3 cards. And I'm doing fairly well. I'm, I'm good at this game, I think. I feel like I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> I have I have more draws than I do losses, which might not sound that great, but whenever you're fighting people that are either a higher tower level than you are or have better cards than you do, I'm pretty proud of myself for fighting them to a stalemate. So I have lots of draws, and then my wins and losses outside of that are roughly 50-50. So it's probably 50% draws, 25% wins, 25% losses. Which means that you you get more points for a win than you lose for a loss. So at that rate, eventually I will make my way back up to Arena Four. Mm-hmm. It's just taking forever, and it's getting kind of frustrating. Um, it's not making me want to spend money on the game. It's it's not doing that. It's just making me mad at it. But the game is so good. I <laughs> you mad at this it. game? Yes, I'm so salty for this game. <laughs> but it's just so good. The game is so good. I keep playing it like. Well, when we first started recording, I had a thing pop up, and it's like you had a chest unlocked, and you got a free chest, and I can now claim another crown chest if I win you know, enough matches to get 10 crown points. And I'm like, oh, yay. I could, I unlocked a chest. I could play a game. I mean, I can't right now because we're recording a podcast, and I would just basically go silent for five minutes while I concentrate. But, <laughs> like, I'm... Uh, I, sort of like whatever you're talking about, Eve. Yeah. Yeah. Except you go quiet for, like, five minutes. But... I really enjoy the game. I think that's a testament to how good a game it is, but God, it's frustrating. So frustrating. If I could just open more chests or keep earning them when I played so I could keep playing and improving my deck build. and So it's basically has the problem that I had with Hearthstone, which 
uh, Spellweaver kind of alleviated was just the rate that you get cards. Yeah. Uh, when you boil it down. Yeah, honestly, that's the because problem. That's something I really didn't talk about was that Spellweaver makes it a lot easier to get cards than Hearthstone does. But yeah, uh, to be honest, Hearthstone uh, it, uh, really feels like it's made to pay. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, Clash Royale is trying really hard to get you to spend money, but it's still... Really? I, I never got the <laughs> sense of that. It's still Are you sure about this? I'm positive. Yeah, I, I know it's hard to believe. But it still is super fair without having to spend money. But yeah, I think that their matchmaking system needs some work. Um, because it is it is frustrating to constantly fight people who have been in a higher arena than you are and have more cards than you do and or more experience. But it's like I'm sitting at the top of Arena 3. So I'm either getting fights with people of my level, which is when I win, or people from a higher level, which is when I draw or lose, 9 times out of 10. Occasionally somebody comes along that's better than me, and they they beat me, you know. I mean, it's not like they cheated or whatever. I mean, they genuinely beat me. It's like, oh, good for you guys. You know, you're good players. Oh, no, I have a friend that I'm sure that they would say that uh, they cheated if they beat them. Well, your friend's a dumbass. (laughs) <laughs> i've heard so many yeah, and, stories about him he's just a dumbass yeah well uh bye-bye child yeah. friendliness rating again <laughs> yeah i don't want to share too many it's just oh no it's fine you can tell me all the stories you want about yeah. him it's just that's he's a dumbass but so yeah that's my clash royale tales for this week uh drawing though i will say drawing is extremely satisfying because like there's so much going on it's like i'm getting all tense and my palms are starting to get a little bit sweaty and it's like oh if i can't if i can't survive this he's gonna be. Do you uh, do, uh, need some alone, Tom? <laughs> That's not that kind of sweaty. Uh, that kind sure. of sweaty comes later after we're done recording. We have oh, our post podcast pump, if you know what I mean. But uh, <laughs> you know, it's so it's so engaging. It's like, oh, if I can't survive this, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna lose. And it's like, oh, you beat me. It's like, oh, counter attack, counter attack. There's 15 seconds left. Maybe I can destroy his tower. And like he fights me back, and then the timer runs out. It's great stuff. Just. Oh, so frustrating. The chests, the flipping chests, and then having to fight people who are with a, a crummy matchmaking system. Well, matchmaking's always been the bane of so many <laughs> games. It's uh, it's really hard to get it right. Yeah, and you don't notice it at the bottom level because I, you know everybody sucks at the bottom level. Or someone has spent a whole bunch of money to get all of their level 1 cards like maxed out, and they're practically immediately in Tier 2 or Arena 2. And then you don't see them while you're kind of learning how to play the game stuck down in Arena yeah. 1. So, like, I didn't have this problem until, you know, I hit Arena 3 for the first time. And then fought my way up through Arena 3 after cresting at Arena 4. But I'm slowly working my way up. My my crowns, which are like your points or whatever, just keep going up slowly but surely. I'll get there one day. I'll be a big kid one day. Put on the big boy pants. That's right. I'll put on my big boy pants. I'll be a (laughs) grown-up. So, on to EVE Online. Now, for those of you... Okay, now I'll take the five-minute break. There you go. For those of you who are following me on Twitter, you probably saw that I posted that I had a good EVE story this week, which is good. I was considering whether or not to talk about it if I keep not having good stories. But I had a good story. So, this involves my old corporation... Oh boy, these guys. The old. My, is this the mutinous guys or? Uh, no, 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 this the is the corporation itself. This is the corporation itself. My, how would I say it? My ex CEO, I guess that's how I would say it, contacted me and he was like, it was this really long message. It was civil. But basically, what the message boiled down to was look, you stole all of our stuff. We want it back. We'd like to buy it from you because we don't want to start a war right now. Because you really damaged our ranks. Whenever, because well, apparently our yeah. mutiny took a lot more people with it. Like we were kind of, <laughs> we were kind of a dam that broke. And once we left and robbed a whole bunch of stuff from them, a whole bunch of other people were like, "Yeah, this is stupid. I'm leaving." Uh, so they want to. They don't want to start a war. Since when? <laughs> I guess they think we can beat them. I'm not sure if they know that that we didn't stick together. The, the message sounded fairly generic. Like, they sent it to all of us trying to gather, I guess, intel about what we were doing. Um, I kind of had that thought after the fact, but I did have that thought that they were trying to figure out what we went to do. 
because you can't see members that are in another corp mm -hmm. so they can see that i'm in a corp but they you know they can't see how many members are in it or anything like that without joining it um but anyways they were saying that their ranks you know they had lost a whole bunch of people and they wanted to get their stuff back and they would like to buy it and perhaps open diplomatic relations like you know yada 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 all this stuff and i was in my head i was like oh yeah that sounds nice that sounds good. Yeah, I'll, I'll meet them. And I'll sell them the stuff that, yeah, that I stole you, from them. You come into the system and there's a couple of warships there for waiting for you? Actually, yes, but I'm not there yet. So, like, at first I had this thought. I had this thought, like, yeah, that'd be really nice. And then I went, wait a second. This is a tra trap. <laughs> yes, it's a trap. This is Eve. So, probably, I mean, they could be telling the truth. They could be. Probably they're not. So what I'm gonna, So, what I did was I said, yes, I will meet you. Uh, be me at this system at this time on this day and it was like some random system like 40 jumps away from where we are currently so you don't give them any idea where the hell you are right um, and then I gave them a random time when not a lot of people would be online from our corporation so nobody would be poking around because we've got a couple of new members and, and one of them in particular is nosy like, he's not my favorite, let's just say. <laughs> um, is, is he the North Star? No, he's not that bad, but he is. He doesn't know when to shut up. Oh, okay, okay, I know. And he I asks way too about. many questions. Oh, I definitely know what you're talking about now. But, so anyways, so I picked a time when almost nobody was on, like 40 jumps away. And then what I did was I took both of my characters. One of them actually had this stuff on them in case it wasn't an ambush. So I took all this stuff, 40 jumps away, in a battleship, so that I could hopefully escape if something went wrong, like horribly wrong. My other character that they had contacted, my main character, I put him in a separate clone that had no implants or anything in it in case it was a double cross and they were gonna kill me. Didn't wanna lose all my valuable implants, so swap clones, got in a shuttle, and put like a, not a shuttle, I got an, um, a rookie ship, which has a big enough cargo hold that you can put a secure container in, mm -hmm. which, which can't be scanned. So I put a secure container in there, locked it, so that it looked like I had uh, something in my... Did you fill it with garbage? No, I didn't put anything in it, I just left it empty. <laughs> um, and then I flew that in. And I was like, okay guys, I'm almost to the system, I'm just a couple of jumps away. We were, you know, we were... Me and the, the old corp leader were in a private chat, just kind of randomly chatting. And I told him, I was like, okay, I'm a couple systems away. Be jumping in in like five to ten minutes. And he said, okay. The second character, my second character I brought that held the stuff, I just docked up in a station where I would be completely safe. Okay. I jumped my main character through, and in local, I see... 10 or 12 names that I recognized from my past corporation. <laughs> and they all, they all decloak on grid, which means I think I explained grid once before, but basically they were all within 150 kilometers of the gate all around it. Cause you can jump in at any, like in kind of a radius around the jump gate. They were yeah. everywhere ready for me. I got tackled immediately, which means that they, um, uh, basically they, they lock you up like hit you with a tractor beam of sorts and it, you can't jump away, you can't move or anything. And they started attacking me. I was in a rookie ship, so I died in like five seconds, if that. Blew me up, grabbed my capsule, shot my capsule, blew it up. Oh, dicks. Concord came, the security, I mean, Concord's at the gate. And they, uh -huh. This was an un, you know, unprovoked attack. So the people that actually attacked me got killed. <laughs> they lost a stealth bomber and uh, two frigates who had who had locked me up, and then um, a cruiser that had decided he wanted to shoot at me too. So all in all, they probably lost it, more than what they would have gained. Oh, way more. I mean, to, if I had actually been stupid enough to bring all of the stuff with me. They would have, you know, they would have gotten their money's worth and then some. But they were so excited to kill me, they didn't even think to look at what ship I was flying. 
Because <laughs> rookie ships are free. If you dock with a station and you don't have a ship, you get a free rookie ship. And then I had a, a small secure container so they couldn't scan it in case they decided they wanted to scan me. Oh, no, they were too busy uh, kicking in the nads. Yeah. So they lost, I'm not sure how much. I'm going to guess at least $150 million. I'm not 100% sure how much suicide bombers cost. Probably, or not suicide, but self bombers cost. Probably more than that. Well, it but was a suicide bomber at this it, point. It was a suicide bomber. But at least $150 million is probably more. Blowing up an empty rookie ship because I figured that it was a trap and I'm not an idiot. <laughs> so I turned my other guy around and went home. And my main clone respawned in my home space station, you know, 40 jumps away. I went home and they were mad. I got an angry message. You double crossed us. You didn't bring anything with you. And I was like, you blew me up. It's your own damn fault that you lost all that money. You attacked me. If you were going to try and really double cross me, you should have tried to have soothed me into a false sense of security. But instead, you just immediately blew me up. That's your own fault. I'm going home. Don't ever talk to me again. <laughs> oh, hey, this guy is a tactical genius. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like the second you warped in, they uh, just gangbanged you. Yeah, I was on grid for, like, I warped in, and when you warp in, you get 60 seconds of cloak from the warp. So you can kind of, in case there's any lag or whatever, you don't get blown up. I warped in. I aligned with the station instead of jumping to it. If I had just jumped, I would have made it to safety, I think. I don't know, they might have locked me up quick enough, but I just wanted to see. Because I saw them in local, all of these people from Peregrine Core in, in local. And I was like, They're, they've got to be here somewhere. So I, I aligned to the station, which moving decloaks you mm -hmm. after you jump in. And as soon as I decloaked, they pounced. <laughs> oh. And the fact that they were mad at you for double crossing them. Yeah. When you didn't do a thing. Yep. I lost. A little bit of time and about 10,000 isk for the secure container. That's wow. it. Wow. That's all I lost. And they lost at least 150 million, probably more. Because <laughs> I don't know right off the top of my head what a stealth bomber costs. Well, that, this is hilarious. And they didn't get their stuff back or anything. Honestly, I'm waiting for a war deck, which would make me sad. Like, I'm just waiting for it. But the thing is, is they still, like, I didn't tell them anything. And they didn't give any indication that any of the other defectors had told them anything. So they still don't know who's working with who, whether we've built multiple corps with alliances or what. And, like, we're, I mean, we're just not talking to each other. But they don't know that. And as long as they have no information, we're safe. And they might give up and go home. Are you going to tell uh, your fellow mutinous uh, scumballs that uh, they pounce you like that? Um, I've considered it, but this just happened on, I think, Sunday. Might have been Saturday. And I, I, like I said, I haven't got to play as much this past week. Um, now, if you brought in your battleship, would you have stood a chance to at least escape? Um, I think so. Because my battleship can, can do a kilometer a second. So even if I, if I had gotten stasis webbed, as long as I didn't engage, I could have jumped out of the system. And then they couldn't have caught me. And my battleship's got over 100,000 effective HP, which is a pretty decent amount for a Tech 1 battleship. I would have survived the first volley from the bombers for sure. And then you would sit there in the bridge and w watch the fireworks show while eating popcorn. Yeah, I would have had to have fled. I couldn't have sat around and tanked 15 of them while Concord killed the ones that engaged me. I couldn't have done that. But I think I could have survived long enough to have escaped. And that's just so hilarious. <laughs> oh, fun, fun times in Eve Online. So yeah, that's my Eve. Story oh, I, I did see a uh, article real quick since we are talking about Eve, about a guy losing uh, eight hundred dollars worth of skill injectors. Oh, I saw. I think I saw that on the subreddit. Was I, I saw that very briefly uh, just before we we started recording. It was a guy who had hundreds of skill injectors. He was taking yeah them several from, million uh, skill points worth of injectors. Yeah, he was taking them from one of the big trade hubs to another one. In I think it was a tier one 
industrial ship, just like a, a regular old ship, nothing special. Like, and was he expecting uh, it not to get scanned or something? I have no idea. The, like, there's regular trade lanes that that gankers watch between the trade hubs, and it, you know, if you're just if you're there on the wrong time and you're going through the regular trade hubs you're going to get killed. I mean, it's just as simple as that. There's a whole bunch of alliances that do that all the time. Even on my kind of, you know, the equivalent of the boonies of space where we live, (laughs) I still get paranoid. You mean the ass end of space? Yeah. I still get paranoid whenever I get close to one of the big trade hubs with a a load of goods to sell because it's like, well, I don't come in from one of the main trade lines, but, you know, someone might still spot me. And I, these guys that do it, you know, quote unquote, for a living in game, they can take out the biggest, toughest ships in 10 or 15 seconds. And I am not one of the biggest, toughest ships. So it would take a miracle for me to survive. Or take uh, just your old aunt's uh, corp being a dumbass again. <laughs> yeah, but they they don't have the kind of loadout to kill an orca in 15 seconds. I could out-tank them in my orca. I know I could. Because I've seen all of their fittings and I've seen them all play. They're not that good. They're gonna to have to wipe out a rookie ship in you know in ten seconds, but yeah. Well, it sounds like your old uh, CEO was Wheatley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, European Wheatley. Oh wait, never mind. <laughs> Wheatley was British, right? Yeah, that's European. But on to the news topics, and today's first news topic is Digital Homicide is suing Jim Starling. Yeah, I want to call him Digital Suicide from now on. <laughs> Yeah. Come on, I'm not the first one to make that joke. Probably. Well, you're the first one I've I've heard, but I'm sure other people have. Okay. Uh, before what we get a mess this is. Yeah, before we get, get neck deep in this because both of us have very strong opinions on this subject. I think they more agree than disagree, but Yeah. We'll get into that in a minute. What is happening is that in case you don't know, Jim Sterling, who is a very large YouTube critic. Oh, you should bring and... his weight into this. <laughs> Jim Sterling is fat. Sorry. But hey, I'm, uh, I'm a fat guy. I can make these jokes. <laughs> Me too, buddy. But uh, he's a very large YouTube critic um, and game reviewer. He does shows like The Jim Quisition, where he really. He's got this personality, um, Jim fucking Sterling's son, which Digital Homicide were the ones who uh, gave him that motif. But, you know, he's just got this larger-than-life, over-the-top character that he does this weekly show where that he discusses problems in the gaming uh, in gaming culture, gaming news, whatever. It's very a very big variety show. Each episode's about 10 minutes long. And then he does kind of your standard YouTube co- uh, content, Let's Plays, critiques. Uh, he doesn't do video reviews. He does written reviews over at his website, thegymquisition.com. And I personally find him to be... Wonderful. You don't like yeah, him I'm, quite as much. Uh, uh, it's just the persona, I guess. Right. Uh, it, it's sort of like, it's the same problem I have with Boogie. I like Boogie as a person. I like it when he's doing his regular stuff, but his Francis character, his Jesse character, all his characters, they just irritate me. Right. That makes sense. I mean, that's totally understandable. Um, yeah, but anyways... I, so that's Jim, and then Digital Homicide is a... A game, game developer that makes crappy games. Oh, wait, now we're going to get sued. <laughs> allegedly. Throw the word allegedly in there. I'll edit it in, and then we'll be fine. Allegedly, allegedly. There we go. Not very. But now they're, they're a game, and I'm using air quotes here, game development studio that makes video games that a couple of years ago, I think it was 2014, um, Jim critiqued rather poorly one of their first games which was not a very good game to be polite um and they got into this big back and forth they got so upset about receiving negative criticism yeah they actually dmca'd him uh at one point uh well it's not exactly the first instance of a crappy developer allegedly crappy crappy uh just using the dmca uh, as a weapon against critique uh, Total Biscuit had it several times. Angry Joe's had it. Yeah, and they weren't... I think that they were the first to hit 
gym, but they definitely weren't the last. And even if they weren't the first, there have been others since then. But anyways, they got into this huge back and forth. They did a video that they called Review the Reviewer, where basically they just put text over the top of Jim's video, giving him Which, all kinds of, you know, calling him lots of yeah. nasty things and not really doing any sort of review or critique at all, just basically trying to get back at him. They DMCA'd him, and this feud has existed between them ever since. And last year, I believe it was last summer, they actually had an, um, what would you call it? A, a conversation over Skype, which Jim recorded and then used um, or put up for all to listen to as a podquisition episode, where they had a discussion and basically just called each other out on all these things. And during that, they threatened to sue him and said that if they didn't, eventually someone else will. And now, after Jim calling them out for several videos since then, or several games since then, not videos, games, they have finally decided that they are suing him. And the grounds of... Allegedly. No, they're definitely suing him. (laughs) I'm joking. Uh, Let me take a minute here and pull the article up and see if I can find all the... Well, here's the thing is that they're not even putting up their own money to do this. They are crowdsourcing, or at least attempting to crowdsource a lawyer. Right. Currently, they are representing themselves in this lawsuit. At the beginning, yeah, which... they tried a crowdfunding campaign to raise money to hire a lawyer. Um, they were actually losing money because people were donating and then doing chargebacks so that they would get hit with a fee for having a chargeback. <laughs> which is hilarious. I... Uh, I, I think it's funny, but it's still, you know, uh, you shouldn't be doing that, to be perfectly frank. Uh, but I, there's a quote, and I'm look, trying to find the uh, uh, the uh, person that originally said it. He who represents himself has a fool for a client. I've never heard that before, but yeah, that's... Oh, it's a Lincoln quote. Okay. I, I wanted to go make sure I was uh, quoting the right uh, person. But yeah, it was a Lincoln that said that. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love to use the word allegedly in front of things. I like using it afterwards. Allegedly. Allegedly. You allegedly <laughs> like to use it allegedly afterwards. Allegedly. <laughs> I'm looking for all the charges. It's not in this article. We've got several news articles. Most of them say the same thing, and then some of them are discussions around the thing. I just want to read off what it is that they are suing him for specifically. Well, I remember uh, defamation of character was one of them. Okay, here we go. Digital Homicide claims Sterling uh, has falsely accused Digital Homicide and caused damages to the company. The company is asking for $2.26 million in direct product damage. So basically that means they want $2.25 million dollars. Yeah, of because their games sales. are going to make that much money. Yeah. Four point Allegedly. $4.3 million in emotional, reputational, and financial distress. So they feel like that they have suffered, personally, $4.3 million worth of damage. Yeah, but their personal suffering is worth uh, nearly twice as much as what their product is. And then $5 million in punitive damage requests. Which I'm not 100% sure what that means. I'm not a legal expert. So let's see what Google has to tell me. What punitive damage... Uh, requests are uh well obviously it's worth more than their emotional distress and their product (laughs) um okay punitive damages basically are punishment so they're trying to punish at least based on just (laughs) banking based on justia.com which came up with my google search is one of the top results uh punitive damages are damages that the um plaintiff can inflict upon the defendant as a type of um, punishment or revenge for the act committed against them. Oh my. So they're trying to get so all this banking mo- money. Yes. They're trying to get this money that they feel like they're owed. Plus they want to get some more just as like, ha ha, you know, we've got you in court. So we're going to take a little more to humiliate you and harm you back. That's how I'm reading that. If anyone out there is a law expert, Please feel free to correct us. Anyway, so that is exactly what they are suing uh, Jim for. Allegedly. <laughs> so. No, that's not going to get old, is it? <laughs> it Actually, that one might. 
Um, both of us dislike G- digital homicide. I think that Jim Sterling is awesome, and you're not the biggest fan of his characters. The non-character yeah. Jim Sterling, do you? I, I like him a lot better. Uh, he has a lot of interesting things to say. I'm not sure if I agree with him all the time. Right. But uh, I, I'm, I am going to say even the character. Uh, he has the complete freedom to say this. And there's an article that we're also going to have in the show notes talking about how Sterling has YouTube and Steam to blame for his lawsuit. And I actually agree with this because YouTube and well Google hasn't been protecting their, well, let's just use the term assets here because that's what they really are at to Google. Outside of just a handful of people, they just haven't been protecting their content creators. Now, Jim, uh, just to jump in here for a second. Uh, uh, yeah, he has been added to the protected circle, but that circle is very, very, very tiny. That's only a handful of millions upon millions of channels yeah it's, it's literally like five or six channels that youtube yeah it's jim sterling pewdiepie's one uh and i couldn't name the rest but yeah it's just literally people on the top let's say hundred i don't think jim sterling's in that list but you know just ones that have been proven that they're getting hammered with the dmca as a weapon and Google's only protecting these very few people. And it, it it feels wrong that they're protecting just these few while everyone else has to deal with copyright strikes and uh, false content claims and getting hammered on the head with the DMCA just because they said the wrong thing about a, a very touchy dev. It, it kind of pisses me off, honestly, as a content creator. Yeah, I want to know, actually... and. At the time of recording, we literally only have that uh, digital homicide suing Jim Sterling for you know the amount of money and the reasons that I just listed, and they're currently seeking a lawyer. That's it. That's all the concrete information we know. Jim Sterling has refused to comment on it, which I uh, think I that's a smart him. move. I don't blame yeah. him for doing that. I, I would imagine a lawyer told him to not comment on it. Well, he said in the past that he has an a lawyer that he actively keeps on retainer and Google has stated in the past that with their protective circle that they are um, will automatically uh, pay for up to a million dollars in legal fees if one of these cases ever goes to court so assuming that they don't somehow renege on that he's got a million bucks worth of lawyers in the bank just from Google not to mention his own lawyer so the only thing that he said is that he's not worried about this at all yeah, yeah, which honestly can't blame him. But I know this is going to come off mean, but uh, hear me out on this. Okay. I want this to go to court. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We need one of these court cases, and we need uh, to win one of these court yeah. cases. I, I, I wanted to make sure I, I wasn't coming off mean, because even though I don't like the character, I've said it before, he has the right to speak his mind, even if people are saying. And I've, I, I will admit, I have thought this as well, you know, trying to, uh, yeah, you know, process my position on this that he's bringing it on himself for going after uh, devs like Dem- digital homicide slash suicide. <laughs> yeah, this is suicide. I, if this doesn't finish off what's left of their company, alleged company, I will be surprised. <laughs> Allegedly, alleged company. I've uh, gone back and forth on trying to figure out where my stance is on. Uh, he's bringing it on himself. Uh, you know, just asking for these companies to sue him. And I think there is some merit there just because he's putting himself out there and going after uh, these crappy companies. And these companies, their primary weapon is to try to silence criticism because they've never heard of the Strazand effect. <laughs> and for those who don't know what the Strazand effect is, Yes, it's after named after Barbara Streisand, who actively tried to get a picture of her house uh, silenced off media, essentially. Uh, threatening lawsuits and all that, if I recall correctly, allegedly. <laughs> uh, but 
if you actually go, I, I think it's on the Wikipedia page. If not, it's on the TV Tropes page. And look up the Streisand effect. And there is a picture of her house, the exact picture she was trying to get people not to see. <laughs> I'm looking it up on Wikipedia right now. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if it's on Wikipedia or TV Tropes that has the link to uh, the picture. It's Wikipedia. I mean, it might be on TV Tropes as well, but I looked it up on Wikipedia. And like the first thing, this is the image of Streisand's Malibu house that led to the naming of the effect. Yeah, uh, if I recall correctly, she just didn't want people to know how big a house she lived in. That is a pretty big house, I have to say. Yeah, but she's also a pretty darn, uh, well, can you call it singing? Allegedly? (laughs) I think we could allegedly call it alleged (laughs) singing. But yeah, they've never heard of the Streisand effect, I guess. I mean, that's the only excuse I can think of. Yeah. So... Did have you ever listened to the Skype call that they had? No, I don't know they had that. Yeah, I will I will find it as long as it hasn't been taken down. I mean, I'm sure it's on the internet somewhere, but because yeah, of this they may have taken it down. The internet. Um, but yeah, I'll send you the link to that. It's about an hour and a half long. Yeah, I'll, I'm not sure if I'll listen to it, but I will put it on the show notes if you give me a link. Yeah, it's about an hour and a half long and they just talk to one another as kind of like you know, it's supposed to be a let's bury the hatchet sort of thing. And basically, um, Digital Homicide, what, what's his, what is his name or their names? Because um, I don't want to keep referring to this Digital Homicide. <laughs> well, you could always uh, adopt my name for him. Digital Suicide? Yeah. Okay, James Romaine. A lot of, a lot of J's. <laughs> uh, but anyways, in this call... Jim and James, yes, that is his name, James Romaine, or Roman, not 100% sure how to pronounce that, but anyways, they wind up just having this argument, and if you listen to the call, it's very clear that James Roman has no idea how fair use works, how the copyright system works, or anything. It, he just... Well, I was going to say, to be fair, neither does Google. <laughs> that is true. But it's not even an ignorance thing. Like, he just doesn't know. It's, he's wrong, but no matter what you tell him, he just can't see that he's wrong. Oh, I know a few of those people. You know, it's just, he is right, and he has all of these things, like, in that call that's like, no, I'm right, and you're wrong, and I'm right, and I'm your, and you're wrong. And he just, it's uh, not... Actually, uh, the call, I believe, is in the first article that... uh we have on here i was just looking at the uh youtube videos and it's an hour 38 minutes and eight seconds yeah so you get that he has no idea how this works anyways and it just i don't know what they're doing i don't know what they think they're gonna do they don't have a lawyer they can't get the money for a lawyer they're trying to take this multi-million dollar court case to court by themselves and they don't understand how the law works I don't know if they, I think that it's because he believes so strongly that he's correct that obviously he's going to win this court case when actually it will take, I was going to say a miracle, but what's the opposite of a miracle? The work of Satan? (laughs) It's going to take the work of Satan for them to win this court case. They just Well, to be fair, he does have the best lawyers. (laughs) Absolutely the best. But I just don't know what they think they're going to do. And they keep saying that all of these claims are unfounded. Um, that, you know, J- it's Jim's fault that they haven't made money. And, you know, it's their fault that they have. Yeah, because their game looks so amazing. And, okay, let's, let's just assume. Let's talk about digital homicide for a few minutes. Let's just assume that everything that Jim has ever said about their games. It, well, not everything, but all of the things that he called, calls out that they're so upset about. Let's just say that all of that's wrong. He got it wrong, and they're right. They haven't flipped assets. They haven't just cobbled together a, an artistic mess or a non-artistic mess. Their games don't have stolen mechanics. They don't have stolen images from, from Google. Let's just say that all that's wrong. They're still ugly, broken, boring games with no story cohesion, no... 
interesting gameplay mechanics, menus that don't work. Like, I've played a few digital homicide games. They've had a couple of bundles, and I have bought some of them because the trading cards that are in the games are more valuable than the games themselves. Like, every time a big sale rolls around, usually you can buy all of their games for a dollar and get three or four dollars worth of trading cards out of them. Like, the whole lot, not each individual game. And it's like, why wouldn't you do that? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking to see if I have any of them. Because I have a, oh, I do have the slaughtering grounds from somewhere. But I, I haven't played all of their games, but I've played some of their games, probably four or five of them, before I had, um, what is it, this Idol Master? Yeah. So that I don't have to just play games for trading cards anymore. <laughs> and they're bad. They're just so bad. They're not fun. They're not intuitive. Half the time they don't work, and the other half of the time they don't work well. Yeah, I'm looking at their entire library on Steam, and they have one game out of out of nearly ten that has a positive positive rating. And I don't know how they pulled this off. It's a early access game, right? And maybe on, uh, they're just a uh, publisher or something. Well, on top of that, Digital Homicide has taken on the names of several different studios. And one of them, ECC Games, is an actual game development studio that they are infringing on their own copyrighted material. (laughs) And this is all evidence that is going to be used in this court case that where they're trying to, to get all of Jim's money. Oh, good luck with that. And it's like they don't understand the law. Even if Jim was completely wrong, was blowing everything out of proportion, which maybe I will say that he's using hyperbole, but I don't think he's wrong. Yeah, well, I mean, hyperbole hyperbole is protected as a a type of free criticizing speech. I mean, if hyperbole wasn't protected, late night talk shows wouldn't be a viable (laughs) medium. Every single one of them uses hyperbole. Yeah, very true. And it's funny. Uh, well, like, it's a way to make a yeah, point and to... also be humorous. Yeah, I think that, but I think that's about the best word for a lot of Jim's uh, criticisms. Or, or a lot of criticisms on YouTube in general. Because you'll see uh, videos, you know, the worst game ever. And, you know, and it's not... Uh, tr- uh, now I'm blanking on the name of it. The uh, truck racing game that is literally broken. Um... I know which one you're talking about, but I don't know the name. The, the of one where you fall through the, all the bridges. Yeah, uh, I've seen that on the Angry Video Game Nerd. Uh, he he did a video on it once as like a community request. Uh, big rigs over the road racing. Yep, that's it. Or you know that caliber of game, because there are games that are at least every year that are that caliber. And maybe uh, Digital Homicide is close to that caliber, but. Yeah, it, the the simple fact that they tried to crowdsource this though is just hilarious. Yeah, and you know, as as awful of people as um, Digital Homicide are, don't do that. Don't like give them money and then do a chargeback so that they lose money. That's just stooping down to their level. You don't want to be that kind of person, do you? I mean, is it funny? Yes. Is it a decent thing to do as a human being? No. And you don't want to stoop down to their level as being a not decent human being. Allegedly. <laughs> uh, uh, one thing that they do bring up in the archive of the uh, page where they were asking for crowdfunding was that they were also talking about how Jim's uh, audience was going after them uh, with some rather nasty comments. And you really can't fault Jim Sterling for what his audience does unless he actively is saying, go tear down this company, go uh, call the founder's wife a whore, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And as far as I know, he's never done that. He made one joke one in, in the Skype call. The James from digital homicide brought this up that one time on when Jim used to work for, uh, or used to contract for the escapist in one of his videos. One time he made a joke about creating a lizard army to go attack somebody. 
and he used that as an example of Jim calling his audience out to go attack oh, somebody. Really? And Jim is like, dude, it's a joke I made about a lizard army. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? It was great. But that's the, the only time that anything has ever been re- made reference to my knowledge of Jim, like, saying, go attack somebody. And he's making a joke about creating, a, a like, a, um, a mutant lizard army. Yeah, but uh, trying to hold someone accountable for their audience that isn't actively calling for this action is just mind-bogglingly stupid. Yeah. I mean, you can't do it. You would have to literally put millions, maybe billions of people in prison because followers of political parties and religions and pop stars and movie stars and famous authors say well, and do depending things. On how, depending on how far you go down the list, we could end up in prison because we both have Twitters with uh, a couple hundred followers. Yeah, that is very true. We could. I have up. over 400 followers on Twitter. I could say something and incite a riot. You know, ooh. <laughs> you will stoop to the will of caffeine rage. Subscribe to my channel. <laughs> Give us money. You have to say it, though. You've got the voice. I- Give us money. Oh, baby. <laughs> but I guess. I, I hope my noise gate doesn't like, have shat. <laughs> you know i think that digital suicide is an apt name because i don't i mean aside from their own little fantasy world where they don't understand how anything works there's there's no way they're gonna win this case there's no way i don't even think that with the devil's work at hand if they got the perfect judge and jim had the worst lawyer i still don't think that they could win this case yeah but he has google money on his side as well so yeah it does I just, you know, and this is good. Us, or Jim, I say us, I mean, you know, we are creators. Well, good for content creators. Yeah, it's good for content creators. If this goes to court and Jim wins, which, let's be honest, I'm going to give Jim a 99.9999999% chance to win this. Yeah. And And the other percentage point is literally... Jim walking into the court room, tripping and breaking his neck. <laughs> and dying. And digital homicide yeah. going, oh yeah, he died, so I guess we win. <laughs> yeah, because that is the only way that they will win. Yeah. But uh, us yeah. winning this will be, it'll, it'll set what's called a precedent. Which basically means that any other future cases will look at this case and have to compare themselves to it. And if they if the uh, the plaintiff doesn't meet certain criteria that are significantly different or go above the criteria that digital homicide is bringing to the table, the case will be thrown out because oh, it's basically the same case which we have precedent yeah. for. So there's no point in us even doing this. Yeah, and the thing is that this will uh, the reason why this is so important is that there are so many of these small companies like we've talked about that love to use the Digital Millennium Copyright Act as a weapon to silence criticism. And that is exactly, well, part of what's going on here. If, for some reason, if hell freezes over and we lose, then I, you know, there will be a floodgate of lawsuits that happen where the companies set, sue Many, many content creators, anyone who's ever said anything, you know, negative about their game, and if they feel like they've got enough like to stand on, they'll take them to court and try and get as much money as they can from them. And the, yeah, and, but guess what? My feet aren't cold. <laughs> Mine aren't either. They're nice and toasty in my sockies. Oh my. But... And I know that might sound like the slippery slope logical fallacy, but we've seen it happen in other things before. A case goes to court, um, one side wins, and the other side goes, oh, now there's precedent that shows that we can win. And companies will sue and alligate and all kinds of... Especially in the United States. Oh, yeah. We're super sue happy over here. 
you better believe that companies yeah, like Sony yeah, just, and yeah, just look at the warning labels sometime. Yeah, but I mean, you better believe that a combination of small developers and large developers, and I mean, you. I don't know if I'm going too far in saying that you would see the YouTube criti- uh, critic disappear overnight, but it would be an endangered species. They would, be, uh, yeah. Particularly the smaller ones would just be gone. Right. Some of the big ones. I-, I think Let's Play would also be in severe jeopardy. Yeah. Some of the big YouTubers like Total Biscuit, um, people that are protected by the really big uh, YouTube networks. Some of their big guys, because I'm not f- super familiar with a whole bunch of them. You know, I've got my group that I watch, but, you know, the big guys would be, well, I wouldn't say would be, have a chance at being okay. But people think, like me and you yeah, would would basically, you know, we wouldn't want to risk, a, you know, our livelihood, mm-hmm. which we don't make money on YouTube. But if we get sued. Hey, I have, you know, I've made over $2. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, is if we get sued. <laughs> it's not just going to be, oh, sorry, I don't have any YouTube money to pay you. It's like, oh, well, you lost the lawsuit. What else have you got? Uh, you got a house? Yeah, I'll take that. How about a car? Yeah, I'll take that too. You know? So, I, I, mean, I really I think if things go that route, which I highly doubt, uh, the major YouTubers will leave the U.S. to avoid uh, the lawsuits here. Yeah. And try to set president uh, on, in another country. Yeah. That's a fair statement, but I can't leave the country. I have to stay here. But you know, I feel I feel like at this point we're just beating a dead horse. We've explained it. We got our feelings out. We made fun of digital suicide a while. You know, I I, I like I can't wait to see this case go to court. I can't wait to see. I'm not sure if it will go to court. To be perfectly honest, yeah, I'm not sure. It just will because either. there is no way that they're going to go to court representing themselves, and they can't get a lawyer. They might, and they might. They're the kind of people that are crazy they're... enough to do it. There, and there is no lawyer that's going to get do this pro bono. No. That will look at this case and go, no. <laughs> yeah, no. They they made a statement. I think it's on their uh, whatever crowdfunding page they use. But basically they said, yeah, a lawyer won't work our case without a retainer. Well, duh, because your case is going to lose. So they won't get any money except what you pay them. So, yeah. I mean, th- this case might go to court because they're, they're crazy. But uh, otherwise... Yeah, it, it might not go to court. Well, this is in Arizona, and yeah, maybe the sun's gotten to him. Maybe it has. Hey, if it was in Florida, I'd say it would definitely go to court. I mean, we just saw the whole Gawker thing uh, pan out. Yeah. <laughs> Conversation for a different time. Yeah, let's just put it this way. Uh, Hogan uh, did the leg drop. Big time. Well, moving on from digital homicide suing Jim fucking Sterling's son. Let's talk about the GDC award winners. Oh, uh, do you have your bow tie on? Um, no, I could go get it. I do have a purple bow tie. No, you're not dressed up for the occasion. No, I'm wearing. I I, I got in late. I'm wearing shorts <laughs> and a hoodie. Oh well, things are getting sexy already. Oh yeah, let me just tease that. Pull the zipper down a little bit. <laughs> Anyways, um, so the GDC awards were, was it over the weekend or uh, end of last week? Last, it was at the end of last week. It was right around when the podcast went out. Okay. At this time, there's no actual official, official list on the GDC website. So we have had to look up the winners on a different website. So we are just going yeah, to. Yeah, because, you know, the GDC, you, you know, why would they want to list their own winners? <laughs> So we're just going to read down the list of, of categories, read off the winners, maybe talk about them a little bit. Um, we might, maybe on a couple of categories, talk about some of the other games in the list. Yeah, I'm going to have to bring up another list then because I was using the one that had all the... A, a couple of websites just had a few of the categories as well. It's I don't know why people aren't talking about this more or you know giving a proper in-depth discussion. Because yeah. this is the Game Developers uh, Awards, you know? Yeah, they're one of the more prestigious awards in the industry. You know, they're one of the awards that actually carry weight. Because uh, Again with the fat jokes, what is it with you? <laughs> well, I mean, I am a fat man, so I can make fat jokes. Um, but given that we're an hour and a half into this recording already, we, you know, we may or may not discuss some of the, the categories in depth. Yeah, but, so... Uh... 
Uh, I guess we'll use the worth playing list since they have the entire list. Yeah, they have all of the or the entire list of categories of all the games that won. So best debut, which I'm guessing is like best new game. Uh, I think it's yeah. No, I think it's their first game. Oh, okay, so like best debut from a studio. A uh, studio, yeah. Uh, Moon Studios won it with Ori and the Blind Forest. Yeah, which I haven't played. Have you? I have played it a little bit. Uh, it's a 2D side-scrolling platformer. So you hate it. With a bit of Metrovania in there. So yeah, I really don't like it very much <laughs> in terms of gameplay. I have watched some Let's Play on it, though, because the story is actually very intriguing. And if you're not crying in the first little bit of the game, or like at least not feeling sad, you should really go see a therapist because you have a heart of stone. Uh, so it's like the first 10 minutes of Up? Yeah. It's got a beautiful story. The art style is beautiful. I mean, it's a gorgeous game with a great story. It just <clears> is not the type of game that I like, so I didn't play it for very long. I mostly just watched Let's Plays of the story bits. Okay, best audio. I went to Crypt of the Necrodancer by Brace Yourself Games. Crypt of the Necrodancer. Not a game that I have played, but I am... I'm, I've seen some footage of it. It's basically a rhythm slash roguelite game. It's an, it's, it's an interesting mix of the two genres. Yeah. Um, it's... I'll call it a unique game in, uh, in a non-ironic sense. Yeah. So it's a rhythm-based dungeon crawling um, roguelite game where that you have to. There's different ways you can play. It. There's there are people who play it with a a dance pad, like a DDR dance pad, or you know one of the other ones that that are in that vein to match the patterns as they appear on screen. You also can play it with a controller, and they, you know basically you just have to hit the patterns as they come up in order to move through the dungeon and fight enemies and stuff like that. It's a really neat looking game. Not my cup of tea, but it's a fun looking, fun time having game with a, a unique, several unique mechanics. And then, you know, a, a nice getting run in the ground, 8 bit pixel art, art style. Pixel art? Never seen that style before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next is the Innovation Award, which went to Her Story. Oh, Her Story. Such a good game. Okay, if you haven't played Her Story, there's no, there's literally no way to talk about this game without spoilers. So... Yeah, go ahead. I, or, I haven't played it myself, and it's been one of those games that I'm not sure if I would want to play it or not. It looks almost like a visual novel. It's not. Um, Her Story is an... Okay, spoiler warning. I will be talking about spoilers for approximately... The next two to three minutes. So if you don't want to know any spoilers for her story, skip ahead two to three minutes. I'll keep an eye on the timer so that I don't go over. Starting. Okay, and go. Okay. Her story is an interactive detective type game where you're trying to solve a mystery um, about this murder. And you're sitting in a police station and you've got access to a computer. And the first, there, like when you, whenever you first start, there's one term up there it's murder and you hit search it pulls up a few video clips you watch them and they're video clips of this woman who is telling her story about what happened and as you play through the game um, you start to learn clues about this woman and about her life and about what has happened in the case um, and the developments that the case have been taking and you learn more and more search terms and as you dig into this you realize that this is a huge huge mystery because and the two prevailing theories are that there are two twin sisters or that this one woman has got multiple personalities. And as you explore this murder mystery, you realize that there's just so many hidden things in the game. Like there's Morse code in the game, which you can look up and translate it to find out like that the, the personalities are talking to each other or the sisters are talking to each other through the videos using Morse code in the middle of them. And there's little phrases that come up and there's stories that don't match up. Um, like the, the sisters or the personalities create alibis for one another and you have to go through and sort out what those are. And then there are bits of horror that come into the game. Um, and this, I think that, that 
this woman had multiple personality disorder because you start to see these things as you go through and see um, things that are like a picture of this woman and she's got blood on her and the lights will flicker and you'll randomly hear sirens and some other things. And these are all symptoms of, and I could be biased because I'm my therapist, but these are all symptoms of schizophrenia, which is... And that's two minutes. Uh, is it two minutes? Okay, let's yeah. go three right. minutes. Okay. Let's go three minutes. One more minute if you jumped into the two minute mark. But so they're all symptoms of, of uh, schizophrenia, which is a close cousin to multiple personality disorder. But basically you go through and it, ta- it probably in four hours you can uncover everything and come up with your own answer. And you just go through and you uncover these, all of these things that happen. And it's a super unique, never before seen method of interactive storytelling, which I sat down and I played it with my wife and we were both like on the edge of our seats until the end when we agreed that we thought that it was a, some kind of psychological disorder, probably multiple personalities. But you don't get the answer yourself. No, you do not get the answer. You have to come up with an answer. And there's those two prevailing theories and the game developer said that one of them is correct and he's not going to reveal which one until sometime in the future. Speaking of time, that's three minutes. That is three minutes. So yeah, that's... Uh, and edited, of course. There could be some editing there. Yeah, but you know, that's it's roughly three minutes. So yeah, that's her story. And that is why... Uh, spoiler-free version, it is an exercise in unique storytelling in the ways that you interact with the story in order to determine or in order to experience what happened had to pause for a second to choose the proper spoiler free words. Um, I've never seen this type of storytelling in any other game before. And it's been out for about a year and I haven't seen anything like it since. Yeah. I'm uh, scrolling through the other uh, list to see if I can find uh, what it was up against and I'm not seeing anything. Uh, Her story also won. Let's just go ahead and skip down and read the other her story award. Best handheld mobile game. Which I didn't even realize until this list that it was on mobile devices. Which I suppose it could be playable on mobile devices, but I think that it's a better experience if you play it on your PC. It just makes it easier to interact with the game since so much of it is typing. And it also got best narrative. Yeah. Her story was a great, great narrative. Which, again, plays into really the innovation of the storytelling mechanic. Because I think that story would be really boring and cliched if they didn't present it in the way that they presented it. It was amazing. Okay. uh, Best technology went to The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. I don't really know what to say about this because I don't know what the criteria was for best technology. Yeah, yeah, this is a a very open-ended category, and it's tough to really try to pin down what they're talking about here. It's just... uh, The Witcher 3, I'm not going to take anything away from it. It is a very beautiful game. But I personally haven't played it, so I can't say anything beyond it being a just you know, a open world RPG. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know unless they're talking about, for example, whenever you're playing the game and you go on a quest, um, and you talk to a guy, it's like, oh, hey, I want to you know go hunt this monster or whatever. Just the way that the game handles that, instead of there being like a loading screen, okay, here's the mission area, go kill the monster. It's like. You will walk with the guy or ride a horse or whatever to the mission area the whole time having an interactive conversation. And I'm sure that eats up loads of processing power and is is difficult to code. That sort of thing might be it. It might be graphics. It might be just the behind the scenes game engine. They might have been more specific in the show itself, but we didn't watch the show. so. Yeah, and I actually tried to <laughs> find a... Uh, a vod of it and it was tough to find so i kind of gave up on it it's probably out there and i just uh, didn't find it speaking of vods though there was a clip that was going around that before we get to the next category that is very worth watching the tribute that they did oh yeah they did a, a beautiful tribute to um satura Wada. because if you know i'm sure you got most people know but he died last year um, and he was one of the... Uh, you may want to say who he was. I was going to say he was one of the major creative minds behind Nintendo. I can't think of his actual job title right off the top he, of my he head. He was right president, now. wasn't he? Was he the president? 
I'm I think pretty he, sure he was. I think he was president. We probably sound like idiots to people out there who know, but <laughs> I mean, I'm not. The well, there's biggest, something new. <laughs> I'm not the biggest Nintendo fan. I mean, I like their stuff, but they're not like at the top of my list. But I mean, I knew who he was, and he was behind most of their major series over I mean, the entire history of the of the company, and he had many of their most creative ideas. And his his thing was he always wanted to make things that were fun as gaming experiences. And he, you know, he did things like give away half of his salary so um, the employees underneath him didn't have to take pay cuts whenever the company experienced some hard times. You know, he was he was famous for doing things like that. And those types of industry people don't come along very often. So. And yes, he was the president of Nintendo. I was just going back and double checking that. Right. So, it, I mean, it was sad to see him pass last year. I mean, it was pretty sudden. We were aware of the fact that he had had some health problems, but we didn't know how bad they were until he was already gone. Yeah, he skipped. Uh, I think he skipped E3 last year and then died not too long afterwards. Yeah. Which is. If I recall correctly, I remember Nintendo having this big uh, production with a bunch of puppets. Yeah, and his was one of them, and I and I just wanted to make sure that he was the president, and I, and I wasn't attributing <laughs> that to someone else. <laughs> but it, it was really sad to see him go last year, and they had a beautiful tribute to him this year. You, you should really yes, go watch it. Yes, it'll be in the show notes. Yeah, the link to it will be in the show notes. We, I mean, we just can't describe how beautiful it was. So yeah, there was just uh, it blew up on the internet and just uh, it was very viral. I hate using the term viral, but uh, this one clip from the show just went nuts and for good reason. Right. So back to the list. Best visual art went to Ori in the Blind Forest. Which we all already talked about. Right. And I mean, that was one of the things that, that I said, that it was a beautiful game with an amazing art style. I mean, I'm not surprised and, that it won that category. Uh, yeah, we've already talked about best narrative, her story. Best design, Rocket League. That is an interesting choice. I'm not sure if rocket league was the best design game i will say that it was it's very fun i have played it a, a fair amount and it, it's a very simple game once you b- uh, boil it down it's literally just soccer or football depending on where you live with cars i mean that is uh literally the basis of the game but it's done really well yeah it's a very solid skill-based game it's very fair and it's multiplayer design it works properly. That that's a good bit of design. I I think I can see why they why it won. Um, I just don't know if I would have called it the best design game of of twenty fifteen. But it is a solid game. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm going back and forth between these lists, and uh, there are differences in the lists. I'm not sure if one of these is wrong, or what is going on here though. Because uh, excellence in design on the other list is uh, keep talking and nobody explodes. So I'm not sh- uh, those are two very similar things. I'm and these are dated the proper dates. So maybe there's some sort of confusion with PC Gamer where the other list is or they've editorialized and they're pulling from something else. Maybe. Maybe this is why there isn't an official list. Maybe I don't know, there was some confusion or or something. I don't know. We're too deep in. We're just going to press on with this as our list. <laughs> we, we've gone too far. We have to keep going have to at this keep point. Going. If we're wrong, we'll, we'll issue an apology or something. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly, if we're wrong, we'll issue an alleged apology for the alleged <laughs> misconception. Anyways, best uh, handheld mobile was her story. We said that already. Audience award. Life is strange. Yeah, which uh, on the other list, it's listed as... Undertale, which is why I'm very confused now. Okay, so we're back. This is going to be a little bit disjointed because I don't think I can put it together properly. We stopped to try to figure out what was wrong with our list. And it turns out that Basically, Google screwed up. I searched the GDC awards, and it gave me the PC Gamer article, which I'll still leave in the show notes. And it gave, and but the PC Gamer article is about the IGF awards, Game Developers Choice Awards, which 
is a completely separate award show that happened at about the same time. <laughs> so that's where my confusion came up. And because it came up in a search, I just scrolled right past the uh, title to look to see what the list was because I was trying to find the list. Because the GDC uh, website itself was entirely unhelpful. So what we've been reading so far is the correct list. And yeah, right and there, I've just been uh, I'm going to the PC Gamer article. I've been confusing things just because I'll go and see, like the uh, the award the audience award is different here. Something's wrong. Right. So anything that we said about that in the last oh I don't know five or ten minutes, just just to ignore that. Yeah, it was my fault. I screwed up because I clicked a Google search and didn't read carefully enough because I was looking for a list and I found a list. It was the right time. It was Game Developers uh, Awards. But it was not the GDC. <laughs> Shame on you for getting it wrong. Now take your 40 lashes. Wink. Oh, my. Okay. so I, I like it on the ass. Thank you. Oh, baby. So now that we've got that out of the way, um, Her Story was the... Or no, I'm sorry, not Her Story. Life is Strange was the audience award. Like I said, popular yeah. game. I've been hearing about it for months at this point. No surprise there. Fun game. Uh, game of the Year was Witcher 3 The Wild Hunt. Once again, no surprise. All right. Do you disagree with that or not? Uh, I would have to really sit down and think about it. And I'll honestly have to play some of the other candidates, to be perfectly frank. I will say that I've heard the most positive praise about Witcher 3. And the only real negative stuff I've heard about it has been the slight graphical downgrade from its E3 or wherever uh, uh, pre-release stuff. But... Gameplay wise, I've heard nothing wrong with it. I cannot say the th same thing about games like Fallout 4, which after the honeymoon period was over, people started seeing the warts. Yeah. Personally, I think my game of the year is Fallout 4. Nothing against The Witcher. The Witcher's a great game. Um, I'm, I even go so far as to say I like the original Witcher. A lot of people don't like it for its janky mechanics, but. I love the Witcher series. The Witcher 3 was great. But for me, and I think that this is completely subjective, is that, you know, or my subjective opinion, is that Fallout 4 just did it more for me this year than The Witcher did. Well, to be fair, it is a Fallout game. And if you are looking for a Fallout game, it is a Fallout game. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I, that, that's pretty much the entire thing for Fallout 4 is if you're looking for a Fallout game, it's a Fallout game. Yeah. And I like The Witcher. Good, got a lot of good stuff going for me or for it. But in that type of kind of medieval fantasy style world, the game that I want to play is another Bethesda title, which is The Elder Scrolls. I mean, The Witcher's great, but it's not my top kind of game. So, I mean, that's 100% my subjective opinion, and I totally recognize that. But I would have put Fallout 4 on the list okay well here's a uh entry to the list that confuses me yeah me too. Uh, no, no, not 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 that he's on the list but because it is from a 2016 list yeah the pioneer award notch uh you know the creator of minecraft which as a pioneer yeah i completely agree uh, that he's a pioneer but the thing is that this year? Really? Yeah, maybe all the way back in... Uh, when did Minecraft first come out? 09? Yeah. 2010? I would say somewhere even uh, you know, somewhere around 2012, uh, he would uh, really uh, fit on here. Yeah. But he, he's... You know, he's I, don't th I don't think he's left gaming, but you know, he's cashed out. Yeah, I mean, after he sold Minecraft, he's been living in a in a mansion in, in I think, L.A. Um, I... I've seen him compare his house like to to rappers and stuff. Whenever they're like, "Yeah, check out my crib," he's like, "Yeah, check out my crib." <laughs> the Eminem room. I I love. Yeah, I mean, I follow him on Twitter. I love his snarky tweets and stuff. But you know, I agree with you. Like, not that he shouldn't be on this on the list as an innovator, but it's like, why now? Yeah, especially after he's cashed out. I mean, it's just weird. Maybe this is one of those things where they look backwards you know several years right and wait to see uh, you know all the fallout 
But it's just such a weird position. It's it's like the uh, Game Awards, uh, uh, the Game Award show called the Game Awards, I might add, where they gave a uh, an award. I think it was the first year that they did the awards, the uh, new ones, uh, to basically the Minecraft or to Minecraft, but it was the mobile version of it or something like that. You know, it was basically a way for them to award Minecraft something when they. Uh, when it wasn't eligible otherwise. Right. It was uh, it was either the console version or it was the mobile version or something like that. And it was just just, a, just an odd choice. And that's what this feels like. Yeah, I'm trying to find anywhere the, the people that he was up against for that award just to see. But again, their uh, website is completely is ju- unhelpful. Yeah, maybe this is just one of those things where uh, it's all behind closed doors and they nominate and uh, they don't announce uh, all the nominations. Yeah. I just, um, you know, I mean, I can't think of anybody off the top of my head in 2016 who was like a super huge innovator. Um, maybe Kojima. Um, I mean, Konami snuffed that out pretty quick, but I think Kojima <laughs> would... Uh, he wouldn't have been allowed to accept the reward. <laughs> I think Kojima could have gotten it. I also could have seen the kind of posthumously awarding it um, to when we just talked about him literally like 15 <laughs> minutes ago. I am so bad. Satoru Iwata. I could see them posthumously. Yeah, now I need to go make sure that that clip is from the uh, GDC now that I think about it. but It doesn't matter. It's uh, still a touching clip, so it doesn't really matter that much. I, I could see them, though, awarding it to Satoru Iwata kind of as a, a like a lifetime achievement award or something, you know, posthumously in honor of him or something like that. I, I could have seen that. Um, but just like, you know, like we said, Notch is an innovator, but not this year. Not unless he's doing something that has been completely off my radar. Uh, I think he's always talked about how uh, he any game that he designs, he wants to be basically not known as Notch. And I could completely understand that because it's just, he has such a baggage now with his name uh, i think it's the best way to say it yeah uh so the next award and i don't i don't know what this award means at all the ambassador award goes to tracy fullerton do you know who tracy fullerton is i don't even know who that is <laughs> at least not without some context uh, I, I, I imagine the ambassador award is you know uh, trying to expand gaming oh that is a video that just started playing whenever I opened that page. I apologize if you hear that. <laughs> well, at least I didn't hear it. Let's see. Tracy Fullerton on the transcendent art of game design. So Yeah, so uh, basically trying to expand the uh, world of gaming. And I've uh and I've looked at uh the Wikipedia page and I don't recognize anything here to be per- I'll be perfectly frank, I don't quickly zip over to his wikipedia page to see if i can recognize anything Uh, actually it's the she she okay sexist (laughs) of me to assume that tracy would be a man's name well to be perfectly fair she also has a shaved head and uh her wikipedia uh picture or or battling cancer which is also a possibility yeah uh so you know just glancing at uh, the photo uh, i could understand Uh, and that's probably terrible of me to say Let's see. Nope. I don't recognize any of this stuff either after looking at her Wikipedia page. Um, Uh, I I assume it's uh, for works outside of uh, gaming. Yeah. But Uh, bringing the colliding worlds, I think. And then the final award was the Lifetime Achievement Award for Todd Howard. Who is... The lead designer for Fallout and uh, the Elder Scrolls series. Yep. What else has he done? That's all I know him for is is Bethesda Elder Scrolls uh, well, series. Yeah, done for Elder Scrolls, Fallout 3, and Fallout 4. That is literally all that's listed on Wikipedia. And honestly, he's kind of young to be given a Lifetime Achievement Award. But then again, do we have many older game designers left? Not too many. It looks like his work goes all the way back to 1994 with the Elder Scrolls Arena. Um, yeah, so yeah, so the Elder Scrolls series. Yeah, the Elder Scrolls series, and then 
the more recent iterations yeah, of he's, the Fallout it, basically, series. Basically anything Bethesda wise, which is literally Elder Scrolls and <laughs> Fallout nowadays. Well, he's not that young. He was born in 1971. He, yeah, he's 44. So uh, That's young for to give a Lifetime Achievement Award, yeah, don't you think? Yeah, that's a fair point. Usually those go to people, you know, in their 60s or their 70s, the the standouts of their field, you know, your your Albert Einsteins and whatnot. Which, granted, he's not like a scientist, but, you know, that's the first thing that came into my mind. <laughs> Anyways, I mean, yeah, I think that's young for him to receive a Lifetime Achievement Award, but you're also correct. There's not a, a lot of game developers that are yeah, there's, older than that. I mean, you think about yeah, it. You have it, the old guard from the, uh, the, uh, from the 80s, but a lot of them are gone. Yeah. Because they were people who were older anyways, old computer yeah. programmers and stuff, who just did video games on the side and realized that yeah, there was, it was a, a popular sort of thing. age gap, to be perfectly honest, where you had the old programmers who created, uh, well, let's say just the Nintendo library, to be perfectly frank, because Nintendo you know, loves to reuse their IPs over and over again. They are the ultimate recyclers. Right, and then uh, you have uh, the kids who grew up with that and uh, got into gaming themselves or uh, game design. So you have this sort of weird uh, gap between the very old guard who is mostly gone now. I know that there's at least some left, but they've already been honored. So they're looking at the lifetime achievement award and thinking, eh, "Who do we give this to?" Yeah. It, Maybe this is a way for him to honor Fallout without giving a Fallout the Game of the Year award. Perhaps. Um, I could see that because, you know, award shows do that sometimes. I'm very quickly looking for a list of, of game developers and their ages, but so far I've got nothing. So I'll... Yeah, that would be something that we would have really had to look up beforehand. Because I doubt that there's a Wikipedia list yeah. of uh, known game devs listed by their age. I found a list of all of the game companies in existence and their ages. So I'm, I'll am i do some digging after the show over the next couple of days before this goes up. If I find anything, links will be in the show notes. And if they're not, then that means I didn't find anything. So, Or at least you need to give me the notes. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm pretty good about giving you the notes, I have to say. I'm not sure if I've completely forgotten them ever. They've been late a couple of times, but they they always make it there. But that was the GEDC and part of the uh, IGF. Yeah. <laughs> so, which we don't really need to go into the IGF. GDC is more than enough to be perfectly frank. Right. So that brings us to our last news topic, which is a quick one, which is good because we're at the two hour mark, minus a bit. So. Roughly two hours at this point. But our final news topic topic is a rumor. Um, yeah, well, we're going to treat this as a rumor, even though it's supposedly from a reputable source. Just because there's no official word, and it's literally just this, this one source. Right. It, so I think it's better to safely call this a rumor. Allegedly. Right. And again, <laughs> at the time of recording, since there's a three-day gap, there might be something else that, that comes gap. up since then. <laughs> that gap. But right now we only have one source on this, so we're going to treat it as unconfirmed rumor. But the uh, the Wii U, according to this rumor, is uh, going to stop being this year, and the stop NX, production. Yeah, they'll stop production, and then the NX will be releasing in the next one to two years. I honestly think the NX will be this year or this holiday season if they are killing off the Wii U at this point. They have to get the NX out either holiday or early 2017. There is no uh, wiggle room between that because Nintendo has to sell consoles. Yeah, I think we'll see the first official full-blown announcement of the NX at E3 this year. Yeah, definitely. Hey, okay, I think we're go I think we're going to see a lot of NX stuff uh, at E3 along with the release date. Yeah, I think that the release date will be for next year. I don't think that they'll release it this year. If it's next year, it has to be before, let's say, March. Let's say we're under a year from the NX. Yeah. I think that's a safe thing to say. If, if Nintendo has it launching fall next year, 
they must have a warehouse somewhere absolutely chocked full of Wii U's. Yeah. That's the only thing I could say. I think that we'll see the NX get announced this year. There will be huge Christmas discounts and bundles and whatnot on the Wii U so that they can move as many of those units as possible before the NX releases. End of first quarter, beginning of second quarter, 2017. And then they will sell that through the year and then have some specials at Christmas. Because I can't see them, like, I know that they want to get away from the Wii U. It has done very poorly in comparison to most of their previous consoles, particularly the Wii itself. But I just can't imagine them abandoning it with... Uh, The Wii U has just been such a... I don't want to call it a disappointment, but... I think Nintendo sowed the seeds of the Wii U's. Uh, maybe failure is a strong word for it, but lack of performance with the Wii. Now, hear me out on this. First of all, you have the name confusion. Wii U versus Wii. Oh, yeah. It sounds like an expansion upon the previous console and not a full-blown new console. That was mistake number one. Mistake number two is that they were banking on their Wii sales to sell the Wii U. When the Wii, they sold to nursing homes, they sold to a lot of places that didn't have consoles beforehand. They reached out to non-gamers. And this is a good thing, by the way. I'm not going to say that they shouldn't have done this because they should have. But people that bought the Wii U that you know, weren't into gaming and played maybe Wii Sports or maybe got a, another one of the little dancing games or something, you know, really mark going after the movement based controls. I think banking on them to buy the Wii U was an absolute mistake because these people will not upgrade for a long time because they are happy with what they have. Yeah. They don't have to be on the cutting edge. They don't need the Wii U to play Mario or Zelda or whatever else. They're happy with Wii sports and they're not going to buy another game. Right. I agree with you that, Nintendo seeded the seeds of disappointment with, I mean, exactly what you just said. I basically agree with everything that you said. Brain confusion and the fact that they probably relied on this audience that wasn't interested in annual console replacements because gaming is... Yeah, this has been a very short console cycle for Nintendo. Usually they have about the same uh, length of console cycle. It's just they have this weird mid-step. Is this them trying to get more into line with the other consoles? I don't know. The Wii U is an interesting thing. As a product, it's actually quite brilliant. Uh, It's less expensive than its console counterparts, yet it is roughly the same power level, can play just as many, if not more, games at 1080, 60. And the games that it doesn't play at that, because Nintendo is a very stylistic company, you don't notice you know, that you're not playing a game at 1080p, 60fps because of their art styles. As a machine, it's wonderful. I love it. I break it out every time friends come over. Um, it's the primary system that I used to play games with my family on. That includes my wife. And then whenever my parents come over, I can get my mom to play, like, Mario Kart. Like, it, it's it's a really solid piece of machinery. The, the Wii U gamepad is one of the most comfortable things I've ever held, despite the fact that it looks like somebody shat out some extra plastic around a a god-awful looking tablet like (laughs) it doesn't look good but it feels wonderful like it's a great piece of technology and it just like flopped commercially so it's a weird thing i think that they're just trying to erase it off the map with the nx it's not Uh, so much about it's going to go into the vault with uh all the virtual all the virtual boys uh it did better than a virtual boy but I see what yeah, you did but, there. They're, but they're trying but they're trying to just forget about it. Yeah, I think they're just trying to push it aside and move on to the next thing. I'm sure the NX will be more powerful since some time has progressed and it'll probably cost around the same because Nintendo always goes for affordability versus cutting edge, which has, you know, it typically serves them well. Um, but since they've had such a short cycle on the NX, they might actually completely catch up to the PS4 and Xbox One. I mean, it's all rumor and everything at this point, so who knows? They might actually be able to be more powerful since they're coming to market with their next, you know, I'm doing air quotes again, next generation hardware 
two years after the other guys. So yeah, but the, but then you have oh uh, this is a uh, set that we're going to go in depth on. But we talked about uh, Microsoft possibly doing a uh, Xbox 1.5 or 1.1 or whatever they end up calling it. Well, Sony has come out with rumors saying that they may be doing the same thing. So there's this weird thing going on with consoles in general. Well, Nintendo's been doing that for years. Look at their handheld line. <sighs> I have to say, if that becomes a thing, Nintendo's probably got the jump on them. Their focus on <laughs> price consideration versus raw power will probably give them an edge if that's the way that the console market goes. But, you know, yeah, I which, don't... If the, if the console market goes that way, oh, there's going to be so many people pissed off. Yeah. You know, I I have suspected for some time that this, this year, maybe next year, was going to be the last year for the Wii U. So I won't be surprised if this gets confirmed and is not rumor. I, I won't be surprised in the least bit. I mean... I'm, yeah, same here. It... Uh, it's just the Wii U has been such a weird, weird thing, uh, and partly Microsoft's fault, or not Microsoft, but Nintendo. We got talking about the Xbox, and I got my wires crossed. <laughs> well, uh, Microsoft's taking a market share away from them, so you really can't say it's not Microsoft's fault. <laughs> yeah, uh, but Nintendo's been suffering, and I think partly is the fact that they haven't had their first party lineup as strong on the Wii U as they have in the past. Yeah. I mean, they're definitely holding, I mean, without doubt, they're holding Zelda for the NX. I wouldn't be surprised if they are also going to quickly the, the announce... The next Zelda game. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if they're very quickly going to announce a Metroid game. Um, of course, there will be a new Mario game. Um, you know... Yeah, even though I'm convinced, Mario needs some time on the shelf. Yeah. I think he does, but the thing is, is that Mario has so much brand recognition that it, that's probably a tough call for them because it's like, well, you know, do we re retire our most recognizable face? I mean, Mario, for decades, probably even still today, is the face of video games. It's hard to just put him on the shelf for a while, despite the fact that I think it would be good for that series overall. Yeah, it's just give Luigi a shot, <laughs> you know. Uh... <laughs> they did. Remember the year of Luigi yeah. a couple of years ago? Oh, yeah. He had... What happened to that again? <laughs> well, we got Luigi's Mansion, which was a fun, kind of scary game. And then after that, it was basically just a bunch of Mario games that they replaced Mario <laughs> with Luigi. Yeah, but see, Luigi, uh, uh, he can uh, jump higher. He can. That's because he's skinny. That's fact. When you're fat, you can't jump as high. <laughs> speaking from experience yeah there uh, this rumor i i, I will think it uh, will pan out it's the thing is that when the nx is going to launch that is the big question mark here right now yep and the, and they're just reading the comments on this well i'm not even sure if i can call it an article it's more of a paragraph there are a lot of people upset with Nintendo on this. I don't blame them. I mean, you know, it's I am sad for the Wii U because it's a console that actually is very good, but was cut down by poor marketing, um, brand confusion, and then overall a lack of support from the studio just because yeah, of... Nintendo always has uh, been first party that... They don't have a lot of third-party support, and that's definitely hurt them. Yeah, so those things took a pretty decent computing or a pretty decent gaming device out of the running very quickly. So I'm sad for that, but I don't blame them as a company. I don't blame them for wanting to just move on and make something new and better. Are you ready to commence yeah, with the community? I think, yeah, I think that's a yeah, I think that's about all we have to say about Nintendo. That, uh, we're beating it. Uh, we're beating it like Nintendo beats her IP. <laughs> oh, sick burn, <laughs> bro, sick burn. Uh, do you want to do the audio letter first or the text yeah, letter? Uh, yeah, we could do the audio letter first. Okay, moving into community corner, kicking us off this week is I want to say Kevin. 
Or did I get wrong? Hey, again? Wait, it's Kyle. Uh, screwing up names is my it's thing. It's Kyle. I have called him Kevin three times now, and it's Kyle. <laughs> In my brain, I went, his name is Kyle. Say Kyle. We're Say Kyle. We're going to have to uh, force you to watch all the Home Alone movies just to deprogram <laughs> you from the name Kevin. 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 Anyways. And yes, even uh, the crappier, older ones. Um, see, I'm just going to cut all this out so that I don't sound bad. With our audio letter, uh, here's the, Kyle. The power of the almighty editor. The almighty editor brings you Kyle with his audio letter. Greetings, Caffeine Rage and J. Arthur. I'm sending this in to get your opinions on uh, video games as art, and specifically what uh, sets video games apart from other types of art. The way I see it, video games are composite sorts of art where you're combining visual media, such as your graphics, but that's nothing new. That's like painting or any other sort of visual representation. You've got your story, which is just writing or any other sort of narrative entertainment. You've got your voice acting, which is, okay, it's sort of like your theater as you're trying to convey emotion through tone. And you've got your music, which, again, humans have been making music for millennia. So what sets video games apart? I believe that the interactivity is what sets video games apart, as you could have the prettiest game in the world, but if it doesn't play well, nobody really likes it. And I think that is the sort of art that video games excel in. And I can think of one prime example of a game that combines all of these elements into one very slick, very masterful package. That game is Dark Souls. Without really wanting to spoil the story or anything else that makes Dark Souls great, I'm just going to focus on where it supports my point. And that is in the way that the gameplay mimics the story and is enhanced by the art and the music. So, in Dark Souls, without spoiling, you are playing as an undead human who cannot die, but instead is reborn at bonfires every time that death occurs. Now, in the narrative text, this is a very painful and very traumatic experience, and the more times you go through it, the more and more you lose your humanity and become closer to what's called being hollow. Now, in the lore, the uh, hollowing process is the process by which you lose your will to go on, you no longer want to achieve your goal, and you slowly become just less and less of you and more of a husk. Now, think about this. Dark Souls is a very difficult game. Now, what that entails is any player who keeps dying at a particular segment and keeps coming back will get frustrated and lose the will to continue playing. And this is how the play experience is mirrored in the story, and vice versa. And this is the sort of mirroring to the experience at which you are actually experiencing it yourself that I don't think any other art is able to capture quite as well as video games, which is why I completely agree that video games are in fact probably the most avant-garde and most volatile of the new art forms of the 20th and the 21st century. As a quick digression, and I feel that I can digress a little bit more in my audio letter on this podcast than on the other podcast I contribute to, your conversation about EA and how they sold their soul and strayed from their original vision of integrity reminded me very much of the movie Citizen Kane. There's there's really no point there, I I just kind of saw the parallel. But wrapping up my uh, digression and my audio letter, I would just be curious to hear if you agree with me on my point that the interactivity is what sets video games apart as an art form, or if it's actually all the parts that come together, or some melding of those two ideas. I'm not entirely sure which is the truth, but I bet that it's going to be an interesting conversation. So thanks for listening, and I'm really looking forward to hearing y'all's opinion on this. Okay, thank you, Kyle, for a wonderful audio letter asking us about art. Yeah, I think this was actually on our general topics list, which uh, we're not going to remove it from that because we could go a lot more in depth on this, can't we? <laughs> Probably. I'm just looking to see if it is on there. If it's not, then it should have been. Yeah. Oh, yep. It's near the top. It's in the top five video games is art. But um, let's see. Do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a little bit of both camps where... Uh, it's the interactivity, but it also is all the parts coming together. I think it's just more about the individual person. Art is very individual. On the Every person experiences art in their own way. They bring all their experiences, uh, all their thoughts, all their feelings. And I think for some people, it is the game mechanics. It is the interactivity. For some others, it's the graphics. For others, it's the sound. 
Uh, that's the important part. And I don't think there's a real cut answer to, for everything. I will say that most video games are art. I'm not convinced on some games. Digital homicide. <laughs> Allegedly. Well, I would uh, go more... Uh, even things like Call of Duty. Uh, you know, ones that are just out there for the gameplay. That they're not trying to do anything particularly interesting uh, otherwise. That they're just trying to you know make an entertaining thing. It, could you consider that art? That's the real question, isn't it? Yeah, and you know, there's certain things... There, there has to be that distinction in every artistic medium. Because, you know, you take a look at like, for example, a Michael Bay Transformers movie. Or some other movie that he's crapped out and ruined over the years. Um, <laughs> Armageddon. I'm not biased at all. I, ha I, I will say that I enjoy watching those movies as like a veg thing. But as movies, they're not good movies. And that's the thing. They're not designed to be artsy pieces like Hurt Locker or... Or, or let's use his example, Citizen Kane. Or Citizen Kane, yeah. They're not movies that are trying to tell us something deeper. They're just a piece of entertainment. And maybe in some way you can consider that a form of art. I'm not going to argue that they're, they have no artistic value at all. But they're yeah, not... Maybe I'm going a little extreme uh, saying that they're not art. I don't think they're, that they're primary. Uh, it's it's uh, not deep art, you know? Yeah, their primary purpose is not reflective art it's more of just entertainment and that in, in itself has some artistic value but it's not the same you know my kids doodle is art but it's not the same as the mona lisa you know yeah, you're not gonna you're gonna hang it up on the fridge you're not gonna hang it up in the louvre yeah exactly maybe the louvre but not the louvre <laughs> oh if only you knew <laughs> um but so, man, I just can't get this sentence started. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I don't think that, that things like that have no artistic value, but I don't think that they're designed to be big talking uh, it's, point it's, pieces of it's art. It's the gaming version of a popcorn movie. Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt you if you have more that you want to say because I was about to start on my main response, but. Uh, <sighs> Trying to think of if there's anything major to really dive into. He did talk about Dark Souls. For me, the uh, well, one of the games that really kind of clicked all together for me was Brothers: A Tale of Two Sons. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you have it. I'm not sure if you played it. I played it. Uh, I played it on Xbox. Actually, I just own it on PC. Okay. Well, yeah, I've uh, played it uh, well, with my controller, which is essentially the same. Uh, the ending sequence, which I won't go too in depth on, uh, that is to me where all the pieces kind of just click together uh, in this. Uh, I don't want to even call it an artsy way, but it just felt right. I'm assuming you're talking about where he crosses the, the final swim. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh huh. And I won't go beyond that. Yeah. Uh, and that's probably uh, too much of a spoiler to begin with. Well, but. I was just going to say where he does the crossing thing at the end. Yeah, which, yeah, uh, it's about the same to, uh, amount of spoilers, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, they're both fairly vague, but if you have any idea about what the game itself is, you Yeah, you know get exactly it. what we're talking about, yeah. where everything just clicks into place. But that's also an example of something that could only be done in gaming, which is using the actual controls to tell a story. Yeah. I think that gaming, what makes it so artistic, is the interactivity of it. Like you said, not that not that art style and story and things like that can't be used to make it artistic, but video games are the only, at least currently, the only interactive art form that we have. Movies and books and painted or sculpted they're pieces passive, of works. They're, they're passive experiences compared to the active experience. Right. All you do is observe and you react based on your personal experience and how you observe the work video games allow you to actually act upon the artistic experience games like um well, well let's Brothers. use her story for example yeah i was going to say her story um <laughs> i mean i mean that's the perfect blend in uh the old media it would literally be a movie yeah you would be watching 
basically, and I'm going to stay as spoiler-free as possible at this point since we already had like a three-minute spoiler discussion on it. Basically, if you were watching it or as a movie or reading it as a book, it would be some kind of mystery story that you would watch unfold. But the way that the game allows you to interact and discover the mystery for your own or for yourself means that you can put it together a number of different ways and find things at certain points and realize, oh, that, you know, oh, this actually doesn't matter because I found it too early to have the context for it or whatever. And all of that allows you to create your own experience. And because of what type of game it is, that experience is deep and has meaning. And the way that you create it is meaningful. And I can't say any more without starting to get spoilery again. But, I mean, that is a very artistic game that is driven purely by the interaction. Because, honestly, the story is is pretty cliched without that. But with it... Okay, how about uh, how about we use another example? Okay. Spec Ops The Line. I was, I was going to say Spec Ops is the first <laughs> game. And then you said, how about we use her story? Um, well, uh, uh, well, uh, well, her story we talked about earlier, and it was a good example of uh, sort of the blending of the two mediums because it is a uh, very video based. Right. Spec Ops: The Line is a game that is artistic purely through, well, not purely, but mostly through your interaction with the game. Um, in case you are unaware, Spec Ops is a third-person shooter. A pretty generic one, honestly, ex- without its story. An extremely generic third-person shooter. However, that is the point of the game. It is a critique of a combination of modern game design, well, at the time, what was modern game design, since it's been several years since that game released. But modern game design, game storytelling, and then a way to mess with the player to make them think. As you go through the game... The game makes you, the game constantly is telling you you have a choice, but it's forcing you to do things. For example, there's a scene in the game where that you come upon a group of, of people uh, and they are executing some people who, as far as you know, are criminals. And you have to do something. You can't just let the crowd disperse. They, they stay there forever unless you act. And the ways that you can act, the game tells you, are um, you can either go in and try and break up the crowd, or you can um, shoot your way through. Uh, but actually, the only way to progress is to shoot your way through the crowd. Like It tells you you have all of these things that you can do, but if you try and do anything except shoot your way through the crowd, they will turn on you and attack you and kill you and not let you pass. So it's telling you you have a choice, but if you do anything except attack them, you can't get through and that is an interactive you know art experience that's designed to make you feel something and until you get to the end of the game and realize what's going on it's mostly just frustration that you feel and then they reveal what the game is about and you go oh and so you go back and you do it again and you realize what they are what they've been getting at the whole time it's a brilliant experience it's a as a a gameplay experience it's not that great but as an interactive art experience it's wonderful in the way that it makes you think and this this interactive art experience has become more and more prominent here lately with games like undertale and what is it pony island i'm not sure on that one i was going more like the stanley parable the stanley parable too but pony island came out um, i honestly hadn't heard of pony island but may have just been uh, under my radar i'm pretty positive it's, it's called pony island um the game starts out as kind of an endless runner and again, to avoid spoilers, you do something at some point that takes you off the beaten path, and then you realize that there's a whole nother game underneath it. And the Endless Runner is just a stupid kind of time killer until you either get bored or figure out what else is going on. It's wonderful, and it, it yeah I, yeah I, th- I think this one just flew under my radar. Yeah, I, you know I won't spoil anything there, but it is a great game that has again another one of those crazy interactive art experiences going on so all of that to say most to to me mostly what separates video games as an art form is the interactivity and what you can do or cause the person experiencing it to feel 
because you know other forms of art are very passive but you can give an interactive art experience a little something more and nudge the participants into experiencing feelings you can try and guide them towards a certain feeling uh, that doesn't always work based on people's personal experiences but you still are more likely to provoke feelings which i think is the main point of art to provoke us to feel and think and the, that emotional response yeah either good or uh negative there's uh i think that it, i agree with you that is a very important thing uh to define art yeah i'm not sure if uh, it's a requirement or not it because once again i said a lot of art is personal I'll look at something and consider it different than you would. Right. And I will say, as like a final thing, I have felt more. I have cried more, felt angry more, felt sad more at things that I have experienced in video games than probably all other art forms combined. Yeah, there's a certain helplessness uh, that you feel if uh, something bad happens in a story while you are controlling a character compared to watching the story unfold as a movie. Uh, one of the first experiences I had with this was actually Final Fantasy VII, uh, the end of disc one. When you... Uh, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, Aerith's uh, death, or Aerith's death, depending on the translation you're using. Is that disc one? I thought that was disc two. Yeah. No, that's the end of disc one, uh, going into disc two. Okay. Uh it's uh, the ending cut uh, scene of disc one. And just having that, uh, seeing Sephiroth come down with uh, his sword and knowing there's nothing that you could have done. It was her choice. But at the same time, you have this powerless feeling because uh, you brought her here. And even though you didn't have a choice story wise, there's this emotional response that you have just because of uh, it was your actions that led to this uh, character's death. Right. Huh. Rather than it being, oh, that's just the way the story goes in a movie or a book. Yeah. It's like, I, I brought her here. I caused this, even if I didn't mean to. Even if mm -hmm. it is part of the story, I still did it. Yeah, that, that was actually a very good in-depth conversation as opposed to just a quick response to the letter. We might mark that off the list, actually. I don't know. We can talk about it later. Moving on to our second letter is a text letter from our good friend, Unknown Spaceman. And I close the tab. Yeah, since this, yeah, since this is uh, addressed to you, maybe I should read it so I have something to do during this. Sure, you read it. I also <laughs> close the tab so I don't even have to open it anymore. I'm not sure how. Hey we're guys, playing. I have a quick gamer dad question for Jared. We were playing Warframe a while back and you wanted to make sure your kid wasn't able to see all the sweet glory space violence happening on screen. I was surprised that even at such a young age, you're already being careful about what he was viewing. My little dude is only a couple of weeks old now, which, uh, by the way, congratulations once again. Yep, congrats. So I doubt he could comprehend anything going on on the computer, but at what age should I stop playing M-rated stuff around him? Unknown Spaceman. P.S. I have a question for Rage 2, but for the sake of keeping the show under four hours, I'll save that one for next week's letter, which makes me wonder what you're going to ask me. <laughs> well... To answer your question with the, the most unhelpful answer ever, it's complicated. <laughs> oh, you're not going to say it's interesting? <laughs> Allegedly? It's interesting. Um, kids don't develop in the same areas at the same rate. By the time you get to four or five, you can pretty well normalize it. Um, and you definitely should not be letting your kids experience M-rated games at four or five. They'll have nightmares. But when they're that little... You kind of have to just feel your kid out. For example, my kid is like a sponge and he learns things super quick. Like he was taking on things that he saw when we watched TV or, or I played video games at like nine or 10 months, which is pretty early for cognitive development. Normally that doesn't start to happen until around a year and a half, maybe even closer to two years. So... Whenever you start to notice your kid mimicking things that he sees on TV whenever you watch it, or whenever he starts to talk, because... He... So in other words, if you're cussing around him and he starts cussing back. Yeah. 
whenever your kid turns into a parrot or <laughs> or you notice that they start to mimic things on TV or you know if they see you playing games that's when you want to start curtailing some of that because at that point they're cogn- cognitively able to begin processing and understanding things that they see and start incorporating that into their own experience um, you're probably safe at, for at least six months. Um, I, mean, I mean, you are. You're in the clear for six months. There's no memory that's formed before that point anyways. Um, honestly, you could probably get away with it for a year. There are, is some evidence that people can retain memories at around the year mark, but that's very, very rare. So at least six months, probably a year, unless you have a, a kid, like one of the rare kids that starts talking before their first year. And I do mean like general talking. Kids will mimic sounds that they hear. Like that's why so many parents think their kids start talking because they'll say ma, 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 or da, 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 da. And they think they're saying, oh, he's saying mom or dad, but he's not, or she's not. They're just mimicking a sound that they heard. And M's and D's are very easy for kids to pick up on. They don't require a lot of tongue interaction with with speaking. That was probably a really bad way to explain that, but I, I'm I'm not saying a thing. <laughs> so you're fine for six months, probably a year, unless you get a kid who who starts actually talking before the year point. After that, you just have to, like I said, if he starts mimicking things that he sees on TV, or if he starts talking, you should start being more careful about what you expose him to, because that means he's in sponge mode and is going to start absorbing all of that and taking it in and video games don't cause violence but at that age when they have no comprehension of what is going on they can cause things like nightmares and um, distorted views of reality i mean so probably don't want to play warframe around him otherwise it You'll have them dreaming of a screaming uh, thing with a giant sword. That's pretty scary. I have nightmares sometimes, and I'm a (laughs) grown-ass man. So, yeah. You're safe for a while, Spaceman. And you're, I mean, you're free to hit me up if you're unsure at some point in the future. But congrats on the baby. You're going to be fine. Yeah, congrats on the successful EVA. (laughs) The unknown space kid is here. (laughs) Uh, do we have any tweets this week? Uh, yeah, we have a few. Okay, well that wraps up the letters. Rage, give us the tweets. Okay, Million Lights. I like the, that title. I'll listen to it on Sunday, referring to uh, it's all Million Lights' fault from the last episode. Right. <laughs> Kyle, keeping it classy with swear words in Latin is always a good call. <laughs> okay. Uh, Haywood Floyd. Uh, was Jay really asking who is the leader of China? And then he linked to a video, which I'll throw in the show notes. Uh, a George W. Bush uh, take on who's on first. <laughs> did you uh, did you watch that? I did not watch that. I should go watch that, though. Yeah, uh, If you know who's on first, the Abbott and Costello uh, routine from, oh, geez, it's nearly a century now. I love that. <laughs> who's on first? What's on second? Yeah, it is... Basically, a early 2000s political version of Who's On First. It was brilliant. I'd never seen it before. And then Groove. You asked for the perfect show length of a podcast as long as possible. Well, I'd say uh, three hours plus are great. Oh, by the way, uh, did you notice that this is another Tuesday contribution? It's magic. (laughs) (laughs) And that wraps up the tweets. I'm sad that no one sent us anything about a drinking game. Come on, guys. Drinking game. We need one. You have until next Wednesday because I have to take my... Yeah, we're going to... I'll put out a tweet on that, actually. Okay. Yeah, I have to take my wife to the airport, so we're pushing recording back to Wednesday night. Uh, So you have until next Wednesday. Which means you also have to be... Probably uh, do your editing hungover. Remember this. Uh, well, we won't play the drinking game during that episode. We're, we're going to record some extra stuff. <laughs> the drinking game will go in one of those things that we record. Or maybe even the next episode of the podcast. But 
I can't come in. You just want to use that sake, don't you? Uh, oh, it probably won't last that long. <laughs> I'll have to break out the bottle of scotch or something. But, yeah. During one of the things that we do while my wife is gone. Oh, ma. Yeah, baby. Well, shall we talk about weekly deals? Let us talk about our weekly deals. I have a couple. I have three. All right, you go first and I'll intersperse. Come on. Okay. Yeah, I have two positives and one... Uh, well, I'll have to tell you about it. Oh, boy. You know what? Let's just start with that one. Okay, so this first one that's a little... Uh, is a game that's called Loco Land. Uh, it is an older real-time strategy game but it's based around trains so essentially you are building trains war trains and you know sending them over rail lines to capture bases destroy enemy trains that sort of thing it's a pretty old game so it doesn't run properly in modern resolutions which sucks but otherwise it's a lot of fun yeah i see the screenshots are looks like four by three and they have this uh border showing uh, loco land in this uh, train yeah there is a border around the game itself whenever you're playing it it i don't remember what it says the and part is that when i purchased this game when it first released on steam uh during the holiday no during the summer sale last year it had a virus in the installer Ooh. yeah uh how did that get passed no idea I killed the virus, I reported it to Steam, I reported it to them, nothing happened for a long time, then there was finally an update that said that it fixed issues with the game, and I've been terrified to download it since because it didn't confirm or deny whether or not the virus was still in the installer. So, if you're either really brave, or are... Or really stupid. Yeah, or really stupid, or are able to track down... Whether, Actually, I see your post on the forums. Mm -hmm, are able to track down whether or not the virus has been actually removed from the installer. It's a fun game. I played it for maybe two hours before I realized what had happened. Like, just under the refund limit. Because I refunded that immediately once I discovered it. Um, it's a fun game. It's got a decent amount of strategy, a decent amount of challenge. And... If you're someone like me who loves RTS and absolutely adores trains, it I mean it scratches like a perfect itch. Uh even when they interrupted the recording? Huh? Uh trains? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and for those who don't know, I live uh probably within 500 feet of a railroad crossing and a uh, train blew by during uh the recording and uh, law requires them to blow the uh, train whistle, and it's loud. And in response, I go, choo-choo. Which, if yeah, it, There's a reason why I sleep with earplugs, by the way. If that winds up not being edited out, uh, then you will hear the train. But, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I love trains. I have like six or seven, at least, maybe more, train games on in my Steam library. Well, here's one that's not a train game. It's my choice, or my first one, I should say. Okay. Uh, it may not have trains, but it does have robots. It's Robot Roller Derby Disco Dodgeball. <laughs> this is a very, very fun game that I'm sad doesn't have a bigger multiplayer base to it because it is just a blast. It is a first-person shooter, uh, technically, and you are a robot playing dodgeball in a disco. Uh Go ahead and punch up the uh, screenshots for that because I think you'll be amused by I it. I have seen this game. Uh, Total Biscuit did a 15 minutes of game of it when yeah. he was doing that series. And then he loved it so much that he went on to do a full WTF is. Yeah, it is a lot of fun. It's it's one of those games that you look at it and don't think there's a lot to it. But once you play it, uh, let's put it this way. The first time I played it, uh, I found myself just grinning the entire time because it was so much fun. It is the perfect LAN party game just because it's fairly cheap for a four pack, uh, even without uh, the discount. Yeah. And even uh, with, uh, since there's not a huge player base, you know, buying a four pack and uh, giving it to a few friends, it's a good way to spend a uh, weekend together. Oh my gosh, we should do that for a. Uh... A Kerbal Cast MP. 
We should totally uh, do possibly. that. Uh, well, right now it's... Uh, well, I, I do have a few other things to say, but I'll go ahead and go into the price of it. It's 50% off with... Uh, and it's uh, 3 bucks uh, 99 right now, or the four-pack is also 50% off, and it's $9.99. And, uh, it's not just a dodgeball, by the way. There's other game modes. There's a, uh, a racing mode where you're racing around the arena. Uh, you have to hit checkpoints, but the dodgeballs are still in. So it gets this whole Mario Kart-like thing where you're trying to uh, kill the other people. And oh, there are power-ups, by the way. Nothing particularly game-winning. There's jetpacks. Uh, there is a homing ball, but it uh, does a fair curve. It doesn't, uh, you know, it's not a laser light. There is a laser ball as well, which just, it's not instant throw. It's uh, just removing essentially the arc to it because everything is thrown uh, physics wise. You know, you're actually throwing the ball and you can catch the balls as well, which is also a lot. It's very challenging to do. <laughs> it is a lot of fun though. Yep. I am currently posting a tweet right now to see if there's any interest in it because I would spend 10 bucks for a four pack for oh, a bunch of us to have it. fun. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. You have it, and then one of my non uh, Kerbalcast Steam friends has it. Yeah, it's, uh, like I said, it's not been a very popular game. There's a little bit of a community around it, and it's gotten a lot of uh, post release love. It does have some in game uh, crafting as well, but it's all cosmetic stuff. So it doesn't really matter that much. There's uh, uh, just things that you could. But put put on your robot to make it look different, right? Uh, it's the sort of the old Team Fortress Two model before they started getting nuts with the crates. But that's Robot Roller Derby Disco Dodgeball. You can dodge a wrench. Uh, you can dodge a ball. <laughs> but oh, and uh, they do have, of course, the photosynthesis. Uh, photosynthesis. It's peak. Well, I do not. It's been a while since I tripped over my own town. Uh, you did it earlier, so. Yeah, we're even. Yeah, basically, if flashing lights uh, cause you problems, do not play this game. There is an option to turn it off, but unfortunately, you still have to go through the main menu, which has the flashing lights. So that is a bit of a problem. Right. Okay. Well, the next game on my list also has lots of flashes in it. It is The Last Federation, which is a bit of a roguelite game in the sense that multiple playthroughs are different in the way that people respond and and you can cause things to play out differently. I do believe there's some progression carryover as well. Um, anyways, what this game is, is it is a top-down, um, not exactly twin-stick shooter. You can actively pause combat to set up moves and attacks, but it's not turn-based either. It's It's got a lot of different elements in it, really. It's hard to describe, but essentially what you're doing is that you are the last of a kind of progenitor race in this this solar system or, or galaxy, however you want to look at the, the map. Um, and you are trying to determine what you want to happen and cause it to play out in, in intergalactic politics. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different starting conditions that you can set up, different races that you can choose like a starting ship from or a piece of technology or whatever and you don't have any direct control of anything you basically are just trying to influence things so that they play out in the way that you want them to and you can do things like um, cause one race to wipe out another race or every other race Uh, you can choose to try and achieve kind of galactic peace or you can try and make yourself the most powerful being in the universe again by going and stealing each, you know, individual race's technology that is the most useful to you. There, I mean, there's tons of stuff that you can do, tons of ways to do it, diplomacy, trade. You can even, like, for example, um, there's this one race that is very, very, um, what's the right word? Environmentally conscious, we'll, we'll call them. Uh, and you can take and you can dump garbage all over their planet, like radioactive waste and stuff, in order to make them upset. And if you play it off right, you can cause like this peace-loving, 
like hippies. I mean, they're basically hippies. You can cause the hippies to get so mad that they can go to war with other races. Wow. And it gets them wiped out because like they're ill prepared for it. But you dump so much garbage on their planet, they're just like, Oh, you're ruining our planet, man. We gotta come get you. <laughs> They'll look fire flowers at you. <laughs> it's it's just a really fun but They'll shoot the brown acid at you. <laughs> it's just a really fun, interesting game that can be played in a bunch of different ways to get a bunch of different outcomes. There's a lot of stuff you can unlock just by doing things differently. It's it's cool. It's cool. It's hard to it's hard to describe it in full. There's just so much going on in the game that you can play through five or six times and get five or six completely different games. So totally recommend it. It's uh six dollars and thirty nine cents. And I forgot to mention what local land was. I already closed the tap, but I think it was like a dollar fifty. Uh too much for the uh chance of a virus, I guess. Yeah. Like I said, if you can't, if you can confirm that there's no virus, it's worth it. But if you can't confirm, pl- you know, buyer beware. Yeah, what was it doing, by the way? If you don't mind me asking, I didn't read your uh, post that much. I just saw it. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was that it was doing. It was interfering with a couple of system level programs. Ooh. I don't know if it was like a worm and it was trying to grow or if I got lucky and my antivirus caught it quickly or if it was just like, I don't know. I have no idea exactly what it was doing. Like it just popped up and it was affecting some system level files and I had things that were starting to crash randomly. And I was like, Nope, we're getting rid of this. We're cleansing. It's time to burn it to the ground. Not, I didn't actually burn my computer to the ground. That's hyperbole, but yeah. Do it from safe mode. It's the only safe way to know for sure. Yeah. Okay, so I guess I should uh, jump in with mine now. Yep, it is your turn. Okay, my second choice is One Way Heroics. A interesting take on the... I guess this could definitely or kind of be called a roguelike instead of roguelite because there's just this weird distinction between the two. Yeah. Uh, essentially, you're running away from the big evil uh, that's just uh, swallowing up the land. I've never beaten this game. I've played it a bit. And it's an interesting take on it because you have to really plan out your route uh, because it's played in, tur- in uh, turns. And as you move, uh, this uh, wall of death essentially behind you is just coming up behind you. And if you fall behind too much or get trapped in a building somewhere with a- and can't get out in time, you're dead and it's game over. It's an interesting take on the uh, subject. I, I don't have a lot to say about it just because I have to play uh, played it to completion. Right. Um, is there progression carryover? Because I'm looking at the screenshots. Uh, there it looks like you get some. graded. Yeah, there's uh, some progression pl- uh, carryover. Uh, not, uh, I didn't get far enough to really get a lot of progression carryover, so I can't say just how much it does uh, overall. But I do know that you do unlock some things uh, eventually. And it does have a, a, an expansion as well, which I don't have experience with, which is actually more expensive than the base game, but it adds more classes and uh, all sorts of goodies. So if you if you really like the game, the expansion is definitely worth it. I just haven't played it enough to be able to really dive into the expansion yet. This looks interesting. And for, 80, yeah, is inter- for 87 it, cents... Yep, it is a very, very, very cheap game. I'll buy that. I was going to say, I'll buy you that. buy that for less than a dollar? Yeah, I was going to say, I'll buy that for a dollar, but it's less than a dollar. <laughs> All right. Yes, right now it is 75% off, and the base game is cheap already at $3.49 usually, and right now as Shrinky Winky <laughs> Mole, Shrinky Winky the Mole Shrink said, <laughs> it's 89 cents right now. Well, I'm in, I just with the expansion being sixty uh, percent off, uh, bringing uh, its usual six forty nine down to two fifty nine. Well, I just bought the base game and it's installing right now. It's like two hundred megs, so it's already finished. Yeah, it's not a huge game. Okay, uh, next on my list, Nexus: The Jupiter Incident. This is a space based RTS. Um, it came out 
I believe in 2006 or 2007. Um, I remember seeing Scott Manley play this at one point. It is... What's the correct way to, to describe it? A more realistic version of Homeworld? Uh, it lacks the production portion of Homeworld, but... Okay, let me just let me just describe it. You are a commander in charge of a spaceship, and as you progress through the game, you gain control of a fleet. There is a very, very excellent, complicated storyline that has got some branching paths on it, which allow you to find different types of research and different materials so that you can upgrade your ships, because it's one of those systems. Um, as you progress through the game, you unlock materials and resources which can be used to modify and upgrade your existing ship or ships as, as you progress, as it were. And there is a lot of variety that you can do. And this game does suffer from kind of that classic game difficulty where that if you screw up early on and make some poor decisions, you're fucked. You'll never win. Yeah, it looks like it was released in 2004. 2004, okay. So even older than I thought it was. Um, the game, and the game very quickly, I won't spoil it if you choose to play it, because the story actually is very excellent. Um, it's a great sci-fi story, but it very, very quickly changes the type of game that it is on you. And, again, like I said, branching paths, you can make different decisions, or explore things differently to unlock things. And it's just a really solid space RTS I actually have never beaten it. Uh, I owned it originally on CD. Uh, it came with four or five CDs. And then I owned it on DVD. And now I own it digitally through Steam. And I have yet to beat it. Uh, I got, I have gotten all the way to the last mission. And then I had that problem where that I had made poor decisions earlier on in the game. And I was fucked. That's happened to me twice. And the fact that I still purchased it again, and pretty soon I'm going to try playing through it again, just goes to show that this is a really excellent game that's worth it. Yeah, it just sounds like it'd be a bit frustrating, though. It is extremely frustrating. I will say that. You are correct. But each time I've played through it, I've gotten better. My first playthrough was awful, because I was probably in high school, maybe even late middle school, when I played this game for the first time. It was real bad. Real bad. And then the second time I played it, I was in college, and so I did better, and I thought that I had done everything properly, and I got to the end and realized that I had made some mistakes with previous fleet upgrades and composition, because it, it just grows and builds as you, as you move forward. And then I realized that I couldn't fight the big boss, and so now, going through it again, I am going to try and make some even better decisions. It's a fun game. Definitely worth the purchase price of uh, $2.49 off 75% from its regular $10. It's definitely worth the $10, but at $2.49, it's a steal. Because to be to have come out in 2004, it looks very good. Yeah, there's a, a certain area where uh, these space games, uh, they have aged, but not to the degree that they look ugly. Yeah. If that makes any sense? Mm-hmm. Uh, Freelancer, uh, when I played it through, it was 2001, 2002, I believe, uh, uh, is when it came out. And yes, the cutscenes uh, were very janky and ugly. The character models were very basic. But the actual space uh, area of it was still very pretty and I didn't do that much graphically other than get it running in an HD format uh, to make it look like that. Yeah, I think it's the art style that a lot of those sci-fi games took at that time when things were still very blocky and very clear polygons were were evident. Yeah, they were able to use it in their ship design. Yeah, they just took it and owned it and made it a part of the ship design. And so the actual graphics have aged a bit for sure, but the design still works well, almost like cell, uh, cell shading. Yeah, it's uh, the reason why uh, Psychonauts looks good still. Because of the art style. Yeah, or the original Wind Waker on GameCube. Or, you know, the original Borderlands or 
you know, so on and so forth. Mini games. But uh, yeah, that's my whole list. And right now, I want to go play Nexus the Jupiter Incident. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not going to. We've got to wrap up the show, and then I've got to go to bed. But well, what you're not going to play Eve first? No, I already played Eve today for a few hours. <gasps> yeah, I know. Big shocker. Yeah, only a few hours. Only a few. Maybe I'll play through the through Nexus. See, I have to be careful. I have to be choosy with what games that I'm I'm going to say that I'm going to play while my wife is gone. <laughs> because two weeks sounds like a lot of time, but when I devote, you know, eight hours a day to Eve Online during that time. Well, uh, plus, uh, you know, at least six hours uh, to the podcast recording. Yeah, probably. Uh, probably. Uh, plus uh, any other uh, additional episodes we record. I, I reckon we'll do 24 hours worth of recording across the two weeks wow <laughs> we're gonna have a, a lot of bank shows well i mean we've talked about doing you know several bank shows we'll have two podcasts at three hours recording each roughly if the bank shows are full episodes you know each one of those is another three hours then although yeah. we could do short form stuff but regardless then we're going to do a binge recording of terraria at mm-hmm. least one we might do two of those in other words, you're going to be sick of me by the time we're done. Nah. <laughs> I'll just go play Eve and cleanse my palate. But no, I, I'm probably looking at half of my time being taken up between Eve and stuff that we're going to do. So Yeah, it, it's this takes up a lot more time than I think people realize. Yeah, especially for me doing the editing. Like, you do your own stuff too. I'm not like just throwing that out, but... You know, for this, yeah, the, sh- the show notes, the uh, research for most of the uh, stuff that we do. Yeah, you do that, but I spend, you know, the three hours recording and then another three hours editing the podcast, and then I also put some time into links and occasionally researching articles and stuff like that too. That's a lot of work. We do a lot of work for you guys, but that is a good. We enjoy it. That is a good segue for me to bring this up. I was doing some some research into our analytics. Um, and total downloads across all platforms for our show, would you like to guess how many times our episodes have been downloaded? This is all of them. Three. Three? <laughs> well. I- I'm jo- I'm joking because I have no idea. <laughs> do you, do you want to take an actual guess? Uh, let's go 150. You're halfway there. We have 200. 300. Yeah, we have almost 300 downloads. We're at 296. Wow. Total downloads across all of our episodes. And I felt very proud to see that. Um, our most popular... I'm uh, actually shocked on that. Our most popular episode is... It's actually very hard to read because these are just giving me the MP3 links. Um, episode something, I Pity the Fool. <laughs> That's our number one episode. Our number two episode is last week's episode, It's All Million Lights Fault. Uh, and we'll blame Million Lights for being uh, most popular because I think he tweeted that out. Well, it's your fault, Million Lights, and we appreciate that. Yeah, if you well, uh, I would say uh, I would go to my YouTube channel and just uh, look at the list there, but I do custom uh, names there, so I <laughs> can't do that. Angelina Jolie's supporting cast is number five. <laughs> Anyways, uh, that wraps us up on our games for the week, which means that the only thing left for us to do is plug our stuff and credit our music. Again? Yep. What's coming up on your channel this week, Rage? And we are definitely well, over the three-hour mark, so oh, let's yeah. do this lightning yeah, so round. I'll, yeah, well, we have uh, the third Let's Play series actually starting up with our co-op, uh, collab stuff. Uh, beyond that, SteamWorld Dig is wrapping up this week, and I'll figure out what I'm going to play next week because I'm back on the choosing. <laughs> you love my, you love it when I come up with terms like this. I like this. that. That's really cute. Uh, there, there's another term in the first episode of Terraria that you just loved. <laughs> Which I'm drawing a blank on right now, but I'm sure. The slums? Oh, right. A goo of slimes. Spoiler alert. Yes, yes. watch Terraria for the uh, the genesis of that term you come up with some more of those too there's one for zombies and there's one for uh the eyeball things anyways carry on uh well steam world dig is uh wrapping up uh dark siders is still going strong and i've actually fixed a recording issue with dark siders i've had dark siders uh, it's been all right it's 
but for some reason it's never recorded at a proper 30 FPS. Well, I did some tweaking with my codex and I finally got that fixed. Uh, you know, even though I'm halfway through the series now. Right. It was more just, uh, you know, trying to fix it, you know, uh, in between recording sessions and then it not working and not wanting to go back and tweak it again. Because, you know, I, I'm not going to spend that long on it. I, I spent that long on uh, Call of Perez. <laughs> <laughs> But, so I uh, finally fixed that, so it should be recording smoothly now. In, well, in theory, well, as smoothly as, as the cinematic 30 FPS will allow. Oh, just just <laughs> twist that knife. <laughs> well, I commented about it being a very cinematic 24 FPS at the beginning of it because I was getting a dip for a while. Which technically that is very cinematic. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the Sunday Sampler is still going strong. Last week, uh, well, when you're listening to this, I did a pre-release look at the game Villagers, a uh, town-building game. It was an interesting run, and I think I have something... It looks actually good uh, for this coming week. I haven't played it yet. I'm going to be recording it probably on Friday after it launches, just so any post-release patches come out. And I'm looking forward to it. It looks like it's going to be a lot of fun, and hopefully it will. And, of course, there's the podcast on Fridays. And you can find all that at Gaming with Caffeine Rage, or you can follow me on Twitter, Gaming with CR. Aw, yeah. So... My stuff, uh, I recorded a very special video over the weekend, and I don't know when it's going to release. Um, Was this your drug awareness video? (laughs) No. Um, One of the most common questions that I get asked, uh, both online and offline, is, what's it... What's your right? (laughs) hundred bucks an hour. Um, Is, what's it like to be a therapist? And I had, let's say, a day, Saturday, uh, this past Saturday, where that some things happened, and I decided to record a video discussing that. Um, it needs to be edited a bit more heavily than some of my other videos. Um, combination of sensitive information that I just decided that I was going to ramble about for too long. And the fact that some of it is incoherent because I was really upset. But I felt like that was the perfect time for me to record this video because there's a lot of emotion that goes into being a therapist. And me just talking about it kind of flatly, like I would talk about video games or whatever, doesn't carry the same weight to the video. So it's recorded, it needs to be edited, and I would like to have it released by next week. So... Hopefully the next time that I, that we record the podcast, I will be saying, hey, that video I talked about will be out this week. Um, but just I want to let you guys know that that is coming so that you can be prepared if you have any questions you want to ask me or something like that. Um, we have regular stream stuff coming this week, VODs from last week's streams, and then my new streams this week. Um, Wednesday night, I guess it won't really matter by the time this comes out, but you need to know this, Rage. Wednesday, you know the the, the crazy married couple that I told you about? Yeah. Uh, they have had to schedule a session with me on Wednesday after or Wednesday evening at six. So no more Wednesday stream. N- no, this or is at least for this. This week? is a one-time thing. I'm not ready to cancel it yet because it might be a quick normal. Um, I almost said a quick normal stream, a quick normal session. If I can get out of there by seven, I'll be home in time to stream. But just so you're aware, I might be like, okay. oh hey, the the stream's canceled, um, and I won't tell anybody else beforehand what that is but since you're here uh so there's that uh and then friday i'm actually i just tweeted while we were recording about robot roller derby disco dodgeball i think i said all that properly as robot roller derby disco dodgeball sunday 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 actually it would be friday 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 for uh, friday night friend zone (laughs) If that doesn't work, then we'll find another game to play for Friday Night Friend Zone. And those are my regular streams, which you can find on twitch.tv slash jarthur4707. I keep going on about this, but my wife and kid are going to be gone for two weeks. They are leaving next Wednesday. Um, And during those two weeks, you will see me 
all over Twitch, all over YouTube with many more videos than usual. And I don't know what they're all going to be yet. How much are you going to drag me along for? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how many they're going to be yet or what they're going to be about. Basically, I'm just going to go, yep, I want to record that today. So just be prepared for a random wave of things to come across my channel in the next couple of weeks. But uh, I guess for this week, yeah, just be on the lookout for the regular stream stuff, our upcoming collab series in Terraria, which we'll have already. Yeah, I was going to say, you uh, you missed the Terraria stuff, which uh, will be released on your channel at the same time as mine. Yep, Wednesday at noon. And um, I've been recording some more special things, some audio stuff. That does not have background yet. Um, I've I've started recording children's books, which are going to be up on my channel in the next couple of weeks. I just have to put all of the pictures together into a a slideshow, basically. Which children's books by Shrinky Winky, <laughs> which is actually pretty easy to do, but it's like I just haven't sat down with Photoshop or or anything here lately, and I just haven't done it. So I got to do that, and hopefully I'll have one of those up over the weekend. Uh, also, my um, Clash Royale video should be up tomorrow, and by tomorrow, I mean you're listening to this hopefully on Friday, and it'll be up tomorrow on Saturday, where I rant and rave about Terraria for, uh, without editing... Clash Royale. Oh, sorry, Clash Royale, without editing for <laughs> for 27 minutes. I've got 27 minutes of raw audio that I'm going to have to cut down. I do ramble and get really mad for a bit about opening treasure chests. You know what would be perfect is if in the middle of that, there was an alert for you to open the treasure chest <laughs> that you could hear. <laughs> there was an alert that I received, but my phone was on silent, so it just like popped up, and a, a silver <laughs> treasure chest is unlocked. And, I, and I'm, I call it out. I was like, oh, look, a flipping silver treasure chest unlocked. Now I have to go on, open it and open another one, or unlock another one. Uh, and you can find all of those videos on my YouTube channel, Gaming Psychologist, and you can follow me on Twitter at jma4707 where i talk about many many things and if you want to ask me questions about psychology or games and then like i said earlier you can follow me on twitch at twitch.tv slash jarthur4707 and if you wish to tweet uh, the podcast itself you could also tweet at vgl podcast or if you wish to email us to get in the community corner that's at vgl podcast at gmail.com and it's not up yet, but it is on my to-do list to do, and I'm going to start plugging it now. We are going to have a Patreon soon. I have talked about that a few times, and I think you were like, yeah, uh, you should make us one. Yeah, I, yeah, I've been back and forth on it. I'm, I, I think it's just I have a, uh, and no, this, uh, this is going to sound very bad. I have a low value on my own work. I just put it out there. And uh, that it's kind of uh, clouded my judgment on the podcast itself. I think. Well, we've got three hundred, and I know you're you're psychoanalyzing me right now, aren't you? I mean, you've got a thing called imposter syndrome, which is not that you don't think that you do work, good work, but that you see other people out there and you like constantly compare yourself, and you just don't see your work as being that good. But I mean, we're up to between um itunes and then other things we're up to 70 subscribers we've got 300 video or we've got 300 direct downloads it does not tell me how many streams we have it might be both of those but yeah and i could uh tell you my youtube copy is uh pulling in about 10 or so views a, a week now which considering that's additional and not uh the main source of the views that's actually pretty good right so I mean, we do good work, and we're just spreading ourselves out there. Wink. Oh, my. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to start putting up a yeah, Patreon. We, uh, and I have been looking at various uh, sponsors. We're, if we do a sponsor, for one, it won't be a gray market reseller. This week's episode and brought to you by Diet Coke, because there's one sitting <laughs> on my desk. Mm, delicious. Uh, let's see. This week's episode brought to you by Salt, <laughs> because that's what's on my desk. Uh, this week's podcast uh, which, brought to you uh, by... Which is, which is hardly uh, new, but if there is a, a sponsor, which uh, I think it's uh, it's not going to be anything major. Uh, for one, it won't be intrusive. Uh, 
and I don't want it to get in the way of the stuff uh, of the show. Yeah, agreed. I mean, if yeah, it's something that we're really going to have to be careful with because it is very off-putting if we suddenly start talking uh, great about EA. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it's just going to be we'll cross that bridge when we come to it because we don't have any sponsor offers or anything like that, so we don't know what they want us to do. Is it a simple ad read or is it, you know, talk up this product for X amount of minutes on your podcast? Yeah, me uh, butchering the ad read and we never get paid. <laughs> <laughs> well that's why i do it yeah but then uh we'd be professionals and that's that's not gonna fly <laughs> well regardless in in the next by the time the next we record the next podcast i will have us a patreon set up but yeah i think we're gonna have to sit down and figure out uh uh tiers though you know rewards uh yeah rewards you give us money we make more episodes <laughs> actually that's not true well, i mean we've been making or this is our 12th official episode and we haven't made a yeah, cent. this will be this is the 14th episode if you go with the pilot and the 0.5 episode yeah so i mean we, we ain't getting paid for this we do it because we love it but well technically we're getting paid through youtube but you know it's a, uh, it's a couple cents or that, that's a slave wage <laughs> I'd say, I mean, slaves didn't make anything, so is it really a slave wage? Okay, it's a sweatshop wage. We, we could uh, make that by putting together our There we go. I'm a Taiwanese kid. <laughs> uh, it would have been an episode if we didn't get politically incorrect, huh? Goodbye, followers from Asia. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll... I think Aki's going to stick around. Te- uh, that's Australia, so it's its own continent. But, yeah, you know, it's the same general area. Yeah. They get put on the same server, so... Yeah, that counts. They're Asia. They're Asian. And goodbye, listeners from Australia. <laughs> goodbye, Aki. <laughs> well, well, to be fair, he's also offline for three months, so he won't know about uh, this till, like, midsummer. <laughs> Unless he's wanting to use up his data plan on uh, this show. <laughs> well, he should. It's worth it. <laughs> but yeah that's something that we'll talk about and we will come back to you next week with a full thing you know more information than just hey we're going to do this and we're letting you know yeah it's something that we're going to have to put a lot of consideration into and be careful with and one thing uh, I am going to say uh, on the start and uh, Jared doesn't know this but I do not want to take content out of the show and hide it behind a Patreon oh no I don't want to do that either the i mean the tiers will be some kind of bonus something that we don't do already but would be willing to do if you gave us money (laughs) that sounds so so bad dance monkey dance you don't want to see me dance there'd be a lot of jiggle physics (laughs) (laughs) oh That was a uh, goodbye view. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, everyone that was left. <laughs> goodbye. Every- Good night, everyone. <laughs> goodbye now. <laughs> Time to start over. Yeah, uh, we're going to have to think of a new name for the podcast now. Uh, bury this. Uh, bury it like Nintendo's burying the Wii U. <laughs> oh, okay. It's 2.30 in the morning. Let's... Yeah, uh, uh, well, we need to plug the website real quick. Yep, plug the website. Uh, video game uh, logic podcast, uh, dot blogspot.com and our intro and outro music is On the Ground by Kevin McLeod, and you can find his work at computech.com. And now it's time for you to quickly get us out of here <laughs> before we do, before any, we more do any more damage to our brand. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We'll see you when you dig this up from the landfill in 20 years. <laughs> bye bye now. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Also, you're just deleting the entire podcast and uh, saying to hell with it? absolutely screw it let's just get rid of it burn it to the ground i don't need it burn it to the ground and uh, build a new one on top of it
absolutely. It sank, so I built another one on top of it. And then that one sank too. But the third time... Maybe it was the fourth, I don't remember. Whatever. <laughs> anyway, we need her huge tracks of <laughs> land. Huge. Oh, that! how many times have we made that joke now? Hundreds? Not enough. Thousands? Oh, you're right, it's not enough. Yeah, which I didn't realize that. Uh, I forgot that she actually removed her breast uh, because of a chance of breast cancer. I actually did not know that. I'm sad now. Does she have fake breasts? Uh, I'm or, not or sure. Or does she wear one of those? Uh, I, 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 didn't, uh, I didn't look. <laughs> I, I just I remembered it after the fact. And Jared is now looking at Angel Lee and Shelley's breasts. I'm, I'm looking for this right now. I'm pretty sure she did. Angelina Jolie removes breasts to prevent cancer, March 5th, 2016. Well, there you go. Oh, the original article was published on May the 19th of 2013. And this is someone commenting on it and tying it into a larger breast cancer narrative. Her mom died at 56 from breast cancer. Um, her children were concerned for her. She got tested, carries the gene, genetic markers for it with an 87% chance of getting breast cancer. And nipped it in the bud. Yep. She also took out her ovaries. She had a 50% chance of getting ovarian cancer. And since she was older and wasn't having any kids, she had them taken out. And the more you know, I guess. Yep. <laughs> and that is going to be this week's outtake, talking about Angelina Jolie's boobs. <laughs> Actually, one more thing. Angelina Jolie, fake breasts. Oh, boy. Here we go. Now you're diving into the rabbit hole. Why is safe search on? <laughs> let's, let's turn that off. Oh, uh, goodbye, child-friendly rating. <laughs> well, they can't see what I'm looking at. Oh, she does, in fact, have breast implants. So she got her real, her real mammaries taken out. She got some fake ones put in place. So she still has the supporting cast. It's just cardboard cutouts now. Uh, that does not bother me in the least bit. <laughs> I just was curious as if she had fake or if she had breast implants or if she wore one of those things. I don't know what you call them. Like I've seen bras that are special for if someone only has one breast removed, but... I don't know mm -hmm. if it's called a bra or if it's, I don't know, like part of a shirt or whatever that just makes it look like you have boobs. Well, this went into a weird place. <laughs> Hooray, boobies. <laughs>